Justin's working something out. Mm-hmm. He's mm-hmm. computating over there. We're live. I have a black rainbow over my head. Dark rainbow timeline. <laughs> this is the This Week in Science live broadcast of our podcast. And we're going to do a show now. Technical difficulties have been dealt with. And... We're so glad to see you. Thank you for joining us. Things may be edited from this video to make the podcast. So if you're here watching this video, then know you are seeing the uncut, unedited, safe for children version of the show. Yes. Fingers crossed. Um, Fingers I crossed. just saw what you named the episode. and I'm very, very happy about it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, tonight, fun. ladies, gentlemen, and everyone here, um, Kiki decided to name the episode while we were talking with each other about <laughs> just all sorts of things. And yep. so she took inspiration from just something that was said, and I love it. I did. Inspiration. You find it all the places. We're ready to start this show. Friends, we have a podcast sign. I need the podcasting now sign. Boop, 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 boop. All right. Let's begin this. In. Oh, yeah. Make sure my audio volume's up. Yep. Volumes are up. I hope we all sound like we're even Steven, five by five, getting ready to do the show. Because I'm going to start in a three. A two. This is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 803, recorded on Wednesday, December 9th, 2020. Bringing light to the darkest timeline. Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Kiki, and today we will fill your head with issues, poo, and beavers. But first... I should really read the show notes. I should, really, I should read the show notes so I can get this part out of the way. And just hit me. <clears throat> disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Of everything that has ever happened, ever been done or occurred in the world, this is the end. The end of everything past. This is the result of the experiment. This is now. And like all nows, we are at the beginning. We are at the designing point of the next experiment. We are at the birth of the future. This is the prelude to everything that is yet to come. The moment of now comes with great responsibility. Choices now will affect nows to come. And now is the only moment in which you can do anything about it. If we make choices based on science and reason and empathy, We can build a future brighter than the one we started with. If we ignore science, if we act without reason, without empathy, we will fall into a future far worse than where we started. Whichever world we end up with, you have at least made one choice that can only help improve our chances. You are now listening to This Week in Science, coming up next. The kind of mind that can't get enough I want to learn everything I want to fill it all up With new discoveries that happen Every day of the week There's only one place to go To find the knowledge I seek I want to know what's happening What's happening What's happening This week in science What's happening What's happening Good science to you, Kiki and Blair. And a good science to you, too, Justin, Blair, and everyone out there. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We're back. We're here. We're ready to talk about science. Ooh, bring in the science light. That's right. Because you know what? Knowledge. It is a light in the dark. And we're here to do that. Everything's yet to come, and we can bring, hold that candle to the darkness. I have stories tonight about humans and nature, some lightness, some supremacy, and brains. 
because I like them. Brain supremacy. Brain. So yes, right. Fully brain supremacy. That's totally what it is. Justin, what did you bring? I've got cat scratch new psychiatric issues. Oh. Call to action. A new Neanderthal cemetery. And do police really need to look and act like the military? The answer is no, but the I would like to hear no. the story the later. No. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a, a study yeah. Yeah. that has been done along these lines. Great. Blair, what's in the animal corner? <laughs> oh, I have beavers. I have animals with COVID. I have uh, dog brains. And I have pandas covered in poop. There's the poo. We knew it would be there eventually. I'm sure this story just is one more reason to love pandas. Oh my god, I cannot care. wait. I don't want to <laughs> hype it up too much, but I feel like this might be my favorite story of 2020. So bear with us here. Get it? Or bear with panda us. Panda with is us. Is it a bear story? Oh, okay. Yeah, panda. All right, let's dig into this science. But before we do, I would like to remind each and every one of you that if you are not yet subscribed to This Week in Science, you can find us all over the place. We are a podcast. You can subscribe to us as a podcast, download us to your device, look for This Week in Science in every podcast directory. You can also find us on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch. Look for This Week in Science or on Twitch, it's Twist Science. You can visit twist.org for information. Okay. Time for the science. The unbearable lightness of quantum supremacy. That's what I want to start with. Okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. There has been a race to build quantum computers. There have been a couple of different designs for quantum computers so far and they're big and they're bulky and they have reliability issues and so far they are they could potentially as they grow be amazing for servers and services that are large scale where you have a building <laughs> to hold your quantum computer computing center in uh but there is a another alternative design that consists of optical light. Laser beams. Because, well, not just because lasers are awesome, but because you can control light. You can use crystals and mirrors to bounce it different directions, control its polarization, to, to really control the way that it works. And Last year, a Chinese quantum computing engineering team, after Google announced that they had reached quantum supremacy, which is still debatable, still debatable, there was a, a Chinese team that announced they had created a computer, a computing device that could potentially also have reached quantum supremacy. They just published about this device of theirs, and it is a really amazing design. The design uses uh, uses lasers and beam splitters. And that's a fairly simple design, but it has to be very, very, very controlled because you're dealing with the detection of photons and the detection of not just any photons, but identical photons, figuring out which way they've gone as they have hit the beam splitter and diverged along their path. Now, the thing about this quantum computer is that it was built to do this problem of detecting and figuring out the probability of where these identical photons would end up once they went through their beam split paths. It solved the problem in four under four minutes, whereas a classical computer like the ones that we're running the show on right now would take about two and a half million years to do the to calculate the same problem. <laughs> okay, that that I was I was gonna say you were gonna, like that my computer even could do that. <laughs> I was like, I it think would take a very 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 uh, very 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 long time. <laughs> how long does it take to do the calculation to figure out that it would take two point five million years? Oh, that's a very good question. Yes. <laughs> you know, probably that a napkin. Sounds... Back of the yeah. napkin bar table okay. dis uh, calculation, I'm sure, with All these right. engineers. I'm absolutely sure. Uh, but uh, 
the classical computers, no, it wouldn't be your desktop computer. We're talking about probably supercomputers. It would take the most powerful computer, classically designed computer with circuit boards and everything, two and a half million years to calculate this problem that was solved in under four minutes by this optically based quantum computer. This is amazing. It's a huge breakthrough. But this computer was only designed to do this one problem. You can't program it. It's not going to be able to do any other kinds of problems. So is it really a computer? Not really. It's just a, de it's a calculating device, but just a very, very... Like a function sp machine? Like a it's, specific it's, it's function one. machine. Yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah, so very exciting development because it could lay the, the, the groundwork for future optical quantum computers that based on their design would take up uh, less space, less energy, could potentially be more useful generally than, um, than other designs that are out there. So a little step forward, a little step back, but cal fast calculations, super fast. Super I, fly. Quick question about this. Not yes. crazy quick, but quick. <laughs> <laughs> Um, quantum quick do they do they know do they have an estimate of how long it will take before the experiment starts because i just imagine that's a very long four minutes so it's like you know four minutes is, is it's very short for something like this but in terms of it taking a computer doing a thing nowadays four minutes is a really long time right so you, right. you can imagine kind of the the researchers kind of sitting there and sitting there and sitting there for four minutes. You're like, is it broken? Is it going to work? Is it going to take 10 years? Right. Is it going to take five minutes? How long right. is it going to take? They must've had like a rough. No, idea, maybe not right? though. Maybe not because maybe this is, maybe this is the great thing. They spend, you know, two years getting this thing built, overthinking everything. Exactly. Designing. Yes. They get to do okay, the one now thing. We're running. All right. Uh, okay. I guess we're going to take shifts. Uh, we're going to have, we have this elaborate alert system to let us know if anything happens. Mostly we just want to make sure the power doesn't go off in case there's a storm next winter <laughs> or, in the, you know, we've got the air conditioners, all coolers are all ready for this, uh, for the heat in the summer to keep all the servers going. Wait, what? We're done? Oh, uh, did we even buy champagne to celebrate? I don't think we even had time. That's good. Yeah, I think it, it probably happened amazingly quick, like compared to like all the time that went into setting it up. Yeah, the the time setting it up, and uh, there's a, a fun comment in one of the articles. Uh, Ars Technica has written an article. Uh, Chris Lee from Ars Technica has written a great article about it. There's a comment he makes about there's there are some very proud graduate students out there for the work that they have done to make this happen. Yes, to bring it together. Um, so the the beam splitters and the way they the way they split the photons, two photons arise arrive at the beam splitter at the exact same moment. And they have a chip that has the equivalent of 300 beam splitters. They have fi 50 inputs, 300 beam splitters, and the possible output states the number that are available is about 10 to the 30. And this is a huge, huge possibility of states. And so the photons get sent in, and then they exit in this random way from all the possible states. And uh, the calculation of that, they do it over and over and over again, but the calculation is much faster. Yes. Ah, Fada says, two photons walk into a bar. Yes, exactly. Two photons walk into a beam splitter. Exactly. <laughs> There are technical de details at work. It, it's a it's a very simple concept at its at its heart, but the technical details are definitely very specific and uh, and interesting to people who uh, enjoy engineering and physics. Hmm. Justin, are, are you going to tell me about cats right now, or are we going to talk about a disease? Oh no no, this is a, an um, uh, an infectious disease story. There oh, is okay. a okay. it's an emerging. Uh, infectious disease that threatens humans. Yes, uh, it's not the COVID-19, uh, which uh, while on the rise currently, hopefully will be declining once uh, we start vaccinating people and, uh, you know, going outside after not going outside for a while still. Got to still stay home and mask all that kind of stuff. Sciencey magic is on the way, though. Uh, meanwhile, there's a bacteria which 
is known to cause fever and rash that has also been now recently found to cause skin lesions and neuropsychiatric symptoms of mental illness. This is a study by North Carolina State University researchers. They found additional instances of Bartonella infection in humans who exhibited these neuropsychiatric symptoms. This is adding to a body of evidence that uh, not only can this infection mimic a spectrum of chronic illnesses, including mental illness, but also that dermatological symptoms may accompany the infection. So this is a bacterium historically associated with cat scratches. Cat scratch fever? Is that what you're talking about? This is cat cat scratch scratch fever. fever. Yeah. Uh, which uh, was yeah, it's, it's uh, thought to be short-lived, uh, have a very limiting uh, infection time period, uh, but it turns out that's probably not as true <laughs> as we thought it was. There's actually 30 different species of this, 13 of which have been found to infect humans, and so they're working on lots of ways of detecting it. It's notorious for hiding in the lining of blood vessels and in the skin. <laughs> But yeah, so this is building off of uh, previous research. This is Edward Breitschwerd, it, 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 uh, published a case study involving an adolescent boy who had been diagnosed with a rapid onset of schizophrenia. Uh, this is not something mm-hmm. that, you know, rapid onset means it wasn't there. And then next week, now he's exhibiting all these schizophrenic signs. He also happened to have these skin lesions. Uh, so the research group documented Bartonella infection and the patient received antimicrobial therapy, all the neuropsychiatric uh, effects and symptoms resolved themselves. Boom. Fixed it. Fantastic. So this is the follow-up study from that work published currently in the journal pathogens They had 33 participants suffering from neuropsychiatric symptoms. This is uh, everything from sleep disorders, migraines, depression, anxiety. Uh, So they were all enrolled in the study. 29 of the 33 participants were found to have Bartonell infections. Yeah, based on the blood work that they did. Uh, PCR testing of the, of the, the serology samples. 24 of the 29 positive participants, that's 83%, reported the appearance of skin lesions during their illnesses as well. So there was also a company, and by skin lesions, there's, depending on what you've got, it can be kind of different, but it's sort of the, the one that the, they were seeing here was kind of interesting. It was basically stretch marks. Yeah. They were getting stretch marks, and it, these were, uh, they of course ruled out things like bodybuilding or rapid weight gain loss, pregnancy, all those sorts of things that you might normally get uh, stretch marks from. These people suddenly had stretch marks and sort of in weird places too. Maybe that weren't normally associated with where you would get stretch marks, but these sort of reddish long elongated lesions. There's other ones too, but I'm not going to talk about those. Uh, But yeah, it turned out like a lot of these cases were just cat scratch fever. And this (laughs) is a notoriously, uh, uh, affects children uh, predominantly. They te- tend to get this more than than adults. Apparently, uh, if you go to the CDC's website on this, the there's a really cute picture of a kitten. Uh, <laughs> I'm looking at it right now. It's yeah. very funny. So apparently, kittens trans transmit this more, even more so than adult cats. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, and another vector is... They don't is, clean themselves as well? I don't maybe? know why it is, but, uh, uh, mm. the, but another vector is fleas. Mm. However, the well, they're, they're the transmission, uh, one of the transmission sources, but the vector really is cats. Cats are the ones that are harboring this bacteria. So if, if Toxoplasma gondii wasn't enough, maybe cat scratch fever will help convince you but isn't it weird that everything we're getting from cats causes uh, psychosis of some sorts? Some sort of uh, schizophrenic side effects? That's Maybe that just explains why cats are the way they are. Hmm. hmm. We will leave, leave our listeners with that as a 
uh, we'll just leave our listeners with that. Blair, yes. tell us about beavers. Sorry, I'm looking at this CDC site. It's scary. Okay, anyway. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we should link to that if I haven't already said it in the show notes. That should be okay. uh, linked um, to there. Anyway, moving on. Beavers, guys, beavers. Let's talk about beavers. Um, what do you want to tell us? Beavers may not only help amphibians, but humans who are threatened by climate change. This is a study from Washington State University, and they did some research in Grifford Pinchot National Forest of the Cascade Range. Ooh. Where they where identified oh very cool they identified forty nine study sites uh, they all had either had or did not have beaver beaver dams and they found that the beaver dam sites were two point seven times higher in amphibian species richness than undam sites and when they looked at the types of amphibians uh, in particular. They saw ones that develop more slowly and need still water that is safe to grow in, which makes sense why the dam would help. And so a couple of species they saw in particular were red-legged frogs and northwestern salamanders. And uh, they are particularly um, at risk from climate change. So they in particular could really do with that extra help from the beavers. Um, Beavers, of course, were once abundant in the Pacific Northwest, but they were hunted nearly to extinction for their sweet, sweet fur. But in an effort to improve wildlife habitat and mitigate the effects of climate extremes, some land managers have started relocating beavers into the historic locations where beavers used to be. Beavers numbers are slowly recovering, which is also, as we mentioned, benefiting amphibians. But the important thing here that is not talked about in this particular article is that amphibians are indicator species. That means they're like the canary in the coal mine to water. So when amphibians disappear, that is bad news for everyone, including us. And that is why there's this question about um, mitigating impacts of climate change. It can mitigate flood problems. It can mitigate uh, water scarcities. It can it can stop all of these problems uh, or slow them if uh, if the amphibians are seeing benefits. So th- it's basically they're they're the first domino to fall when you're looking at water quality and water abundance. Mm-hmm. So as go the amphibians, so do we. Just later. <laughs> so that's why if beavers are helping amphibians. Um, combat the extra pressures from climate change. That means that that can do a a lot potentially to help us in the future. So basically a healthy waterway means healthy ecosystems, means healthy humans in the long run, which is why I think it's so important to recognize that when an animal has huge ecosystem services like beavers making dams, that is more than just saving frogs. And so this proves that they can be reintroduced in these historical ranges and still do a lot of good. I think that's great. Yeah. I mean, the idea of reintroducing them to places where they have been pushed out, hunted to extinction. uh, Mm -hmm. I mean, it could help waterways. I mean, we just had the story this last week of uh, a runoff from car tires being toxic to salmon and Mm -hmm. you know you start adding these things together how can we how can we mitigate those things how can we use the natural environment to help itself too yeah and the the really cool thing about beavers too on a personal note for me is that in the bay area in the san francisco bay area um i didn't know this growing up but this is a historical beaver range as well I always thought beavers were like found in Alaska or something like totally yeah. exotic and different. But in my lifetime, beavers have come back. So they they're in um, the pretty deep East Bay in the in the Bay Delta, but they are starting to come closer and closer into the Bay watershed. So they are recovering in the San Francisco Bay Area, which is very cool. That's really neat. Yeah, that's super cool. Beavers. They're interesting. We should have an interview with, uh, there is somebody who wrote a book about beavers within the last year or two. Oh, I'd love to talk beavers. We should, we should talk beavers. Yeah. More beavers yeah. on the show. That sounds great. There was, uh, wasn't there a reintroduction program in Montana that we talked about some mm-hmm. years ago? Yeah. Um, but yeah, they recreated a just a healthier biome and mm-hmm. it spread out from there with all these ripple effects. 
that, you know, they're more amphibians. Maybe the birds are eating better. They're transferring seeds uh, more around because they're eating better. They're, you know, healthier and more birds. And then. It, yeah, like, well, they're also we... just slowing water down. So the nutrient load in the river is better because mm-hmm. it's not washing all the nutrients away. So, yeah, it has lots of effects. And flood mitigation and all the rest of it. Yeah. Yeah. Go beavers. So many. Well, nature is doing its own thing, and oh, it would be probably doing really great if we weren't impacting it. But two studies are out this week having to do with humans and nature. And oh, I just can't find anything positive to say about these studies. I'd really <laughs> like to. Uh, one per- one study in particular is out of the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And this study looked at, uh, this was 15 leading international experts um, based on the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. It was a global assessment. And they discussed the risk to humans' well-being and prosperity resulting from continued degradation of the environment. They were looking at the ways in which nature provides benefits like material goods, food, wood, medicines, non-material goods, and, uh, and ecological processes that regulate environmental conditions. So water filtration, beavers, you know, being part of the waterways, carbon sequestration, storm protection. And they conclude in their study that the well-being of people is not really not being helped out by nature as much as it used to. We have declining crop yields. We have lower soil productivity, increased exposure to floods and storms. And this is because of the degradation of coastal ecosystems. But pretty much their take home message is nature's nature's contribution to people is found to be in decline. Nature, you're just not giving back. What's up? Um, and then the other study is a uh, a study looking at how humans are impacting nature by what we build. Apparent, according to a study uh, out of the Weizmann Institute of Science, Ron Milo, a systems biologist, started looking into how the mass of what we are building in the world compares to the biomass in the world. So the mass of all the living things on the planet. And they looked between 1900 to 2017. They they pretty much figured out comparatively over the, there's been a change over the last 120 years that until uh, in 1900, the mass of human materials was about 3% of Earth's total biomass. Materials that we have made to build and use have doubled every 20 years, approximately. This is a paper in Nature. Total biomass declined. And we now have gotten to the point where human-made objects, dams, roads, buildings, exceed Earth's total living biomass. It happened this year, maybe, give or take six years. I mean, there's, there's, there are fudge factors, and this is an estimate. Um, if you include water in, the, in biomass, then it's going to take until about 2037 for us to overtake the living parts of the earth with the things that we built. That's only 17, well, yeah, 16 years away. <laughs> so this year... 17 years from now, I, I don't know. We are at this point where we are we are building so much. We are truly in the Anthropocene. We are truly in the age of human impact on the planet. Next. Yeah. Just, you know, just for perspective, people. Thanks. Well, what are we going to do? There's not much to say about that. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, uh, Vroom. we're we're on the path of disassembling, uh, separating uh, the, the nature that evolved on this planet from existing. 
Yeah. Uh, in the up the upside though, uh, our local zoo in Sacramento uh, is looking at a fifty acre site to replace their you know eighty year old fourteen acres. So, oh, that'd be so wonderful. There, we'll get bigger zoos eventually, but yeah. It is depressing, Carol. In the chat room, you're right. This is depressing. We should move on. Tell us a fun story. Tell me a fun <laughs> let story. Let me just let me just tell you uh, one. There's a quote from Eduardo Bronzino, Brondizio, sorry, uh, an anthropologist, environmental anthropologist at Indiana University in Bloomington, who says, "It's not that infrastructure per se is bad. It's how we do infrastructure that is the problem." So, fingers crossed, we can make better plans. Moving forward, knowledge is power. It's true. It's true. Okay, do you have good news, Justin? Oh, oh, it was up to me. Uh, cemeteries? What? Burial yeah. sites? Okay, let's let's. Okay, <laughs> bring it. Uh, well, I wouldn't say it's. Uh, I wouldn't say it's good news exactly, but it's not bad news. I mean, uh, it's about a dead child. But it's a, a child that died 41,000 years ago. So, like, it's been a while, right? It's not too soon to talk about this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, question is, did the Neanderthals really bury their dead? Uh, past evidence has shown that they did. And then the skeptics were skeptical. But then the evidence, again, swung in the direction of, yeah, it looks like they buried them. Now researchers uh, in, in France, Museum National de Histoire Naturelle, National the History Natural and the University of the Basque Country in Spain uh, have demonstrated that a Neanderthal child was buried 41,000 years ago. There are studies published in general scientific reports. So this is a site where six Neanderthal skeletons were discovered way back in the beginning of the 20th century, early 1900s, for those who don't do that math. Uh, the site derived a uh, another, a seventh, in the 1970s, early 1970s, belonging to a child of around two years old. Since that, the collection associated with this specimen has remained unexplored and investigated in the archives of the Musée d'Archéologie Nationale in France. <laughs> Researchers, stumbling upon this, said, Hey, we have a Neanderthal here? Let's check it out. They reopened the excavation notebooks from the 70s, reviewed the material, uh, they uh, revealing 47 new human bones that had not been identified in the original excavation, uh, which they believe belonged to the same skeleton. Scientists also carried out a thorough analysis of the bones, state of preservation, studied the proteins, the genetics, they did some carbon dating, they went back to the original site trying to find more bones, they didn't find more bones, but using the notebooks, of the people who'd done uh, the thorough note-taking, even though they didn't identify 47 bones, who did really good note-taking, were able to reconstruct and interpret the spatial distribution of the human remains as they had been found uh, on site. Researchers showed that the skeleton had been buried in a fresh sedimentary layer, or not fresh, but uh, separately disturbed from the soil around it. Uh, layer with the uh, head elevated higher than the pelvis. The bones were relatively close together and had remained in their anatomical positions. Their, uh, this, this is uh, this preservation indicating that uh, when the child died, it was buried quickly. This is not scattered bones that were windswept or left out in any sort of way, but it was actually buried. So they did, uh, like I said, the carbon dating, uh, which showed it to be around 41,000 years old on the bones. They got the mitochondrial DNA, showing it was a Neanderthal, and proteins that confirmed uh, human as well. Um, so this is, uh, this is one of the most recently directly dated Neanderthal remains. Uh, the new information proves that the body of this two-year-old Neanderthal child was purposely deposited in a pit dug in sedimentary, uh, sedimentary layer around 41,000 years ago, hmm. soon after it had died. This is yet another piece of evidence that Neanderthals had burial rites, that they had a much more complex society than we historically considered them to have. 
Yes, and it's also because we consider that to be a very human trait, burying yeah. our dead, caring for our dead, uh, these sorts of things as being very modern, current modern human, at least. We don't want to share that with any other animal, let alone with other humans that we, at one point at least, and have still like slowly been having to discard all of these myths of the unintelligent cousin. Uh, it seems like they were just as smart as we were. But mm-hmm. it's also sort of interesting that the, you know, when you look at Homo naledi, which is a much older, very different human, uh, very more sort of apish or in between missing linkish. And what we know of them is from a cemetery where they didn't bury their dead, but all the dead seemed to get put. I guess it'd be buried. If you put something way deep down in an intricate cave and leave it there, I think that's on par with, with burying the dead. Just, yeah. just Easy with you don't have to dig the hole if you've already got one. <laughs> yeah, you know what, <laughs> Gary? And this says maybe humans buried them. You know, so that's actually it is in a timeline when there, there would have been uh, some overlapping starting to take place too. So, so you want now you want you're right you want an older example uh, to show that Neanderthals did it first. I, I suppose, but uh, but definitely a Neanderthal child. Fudge. Sorry, what? I'm having a technical difficulty here. I'm trying to. <laughs> I uh, I had a nice website with a nice video, but when I click on things, it takes me to places I don't want to Uh-oh. be. Uh-oh. Yes. Oh no. But it is a st- stay yeah. back in the lane, Kiki. Don't stray, Don't stray off, off the, path. the path. Not with this one. Uh, 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 uh. Okay, here I come. Here I come. Back I come. Moving away from burial sites and uh, our ancestors or cousins and how they buried uh, their family and their friends. Let's uh-huh. talk about bees and oh how they pre- how they protect themselves. <laughs> I totally Let's thought you were about it. to do the COVID update right there. And I was like, well, I don't know if this segment segues. <laughs> no, we're going to talk about protecting, protection. Oh, if bees, we know about certain tactics that honeybees have to protect their hives. We, uh, Blair, you've talked before about uh, the, the heating process that they do where a bunch of honeybees will start vibrating and sh- uh flapping their wings very quickly to heat up the inside of their hive to make it too hot for wasp invaders and and other parasites or uh, or predator species that come in to attack the nest, the hive, make it unsustainable for them to stay and even possibly kill them. Well, there is a new technique that has been discovered in honeybees in Vietnam. Honeybees in Vietnam have to contend with the murder hornet, Mm -hmm. the Asian hornet Vespasaurur. We've decided to call it the murder hornet here in North America. It has been unfortunately introduced into Canada and has been making its way, trying to spread into the rest of North America. We keep trying to catch those hives and and hold off the influx because our honeybees are really not prepared Mm -hmm. for this hive predator. They're well, homebodies. <laughs> they're homebodies, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, these honeybees in Vietnam have been dealing with murder hornets for a very long time. And a researcher in from the University of Guelph was looking at some of these honeybees and determined uh, that talking to Vietnamese honeybee farmers and farmers in the area who had these hives talking about what their bees were doing, what they had seen them been doing, how they were dealing with the murder hornets, because we need to learn tactics for other honeybee species and for potentially these honeybees that we have in the United States. New discovery, Vietnamese honeybees take buffalo poo and they smear it in in front of the doorway to their hive. I'm listening. (laughs) Yes. So they took pictures and they have found that these honeybees will go out. They actually they they put 
piles of dung around to see if the bees would come and pick them up. And yes, indeed, they found lots of honeybees. They really liked the stinkier the poo pile, the more they liked it. And they have pictures of the bees going and getting the poo from the dung piles, bringing it back to the nest, to the hive, and placing the the poo and shaping it and forming it into little artistic welcoming mounds smeared yes. on the front of the hive. And Man. it and it and it it keeps the murder hornets at bay. Is it an odor thing? Is it because the smell of the dung overpowers the scent of the honeybees? Yeah, is it like a masking? Yeah, they they also looked. It, it is some kind of a masking. They also looked and uh, found that hives that did not have dung smeared at the doorway were much more likely to be invaded by murder hornets. Is that what murder hornets look like? Yeah, they're about the size of a uh, a golf tee. They're a bit more. They're about an inch. Three quarters to an inch long. They're they're pretty long, maybe an inch and a half. They're 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 very big. They have these dark backsides. Those don't look like bees. They're like red the and orange and yeah. yeah. So I I guess I've only ever seen the murder hornets pictures um, face face on, like head on. So yes. yeah, they're wild looking. I had no idea. Yeah. So it uh, they are and. As the murder hornets make their way into North America, our honeybees are completely unprepared. Can we smear dung at the doorways of the hives? Can oh we train the honeybees to do this and protect themselves? Will the honeybees learn in the Americas to use the poo? Probably not. For protection? Um, Important question from Shoe Brew in the chat room. Does this impact the honey at all? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you are carrying poo, you're probably not carrying much pollen. You have a different I, job? I think he's more asking if it impacts the flavor and profile the flavor. of the poo. Of the of the poo. Of the honey. <laughs> of the honey. I have no idea. No, no, These no, are no, questions no. left no, no, yet to be determined. Right. I want to know how's the taste of my buffalo poo going to be affected by all of this honey in it? Uh, how will it? Yeah, I think the I think the American honeybee is is the the hybrid poodle. Of the species, I would take it <laughs> take it that any wild form would probably exhibit uh, greater intelligence, greater uh, health, greater anything, uh, flexibility. And so I think I don't know. I don't know if that would be, but it's definitely you know if the buffalo poo works. There's you know a lot of these bees could are be. raised on farms. Maybe there's pl- uh, cattle, cow pies mm-hmm. nowhere nearby. You could just. Put a shovel uh, out in front of the hive somewhere, and maybe that would be fine. Just remember to yeah. not step in it next time you go to check on your bees. But and also, this is the important is, question: is like, does goat poo work, or does it? Is it only soft? They don't poo? know. They have. They don't know yet. They suspect it's an odor repel, odorant repellent, but they don't know what aspect it is. Is there a uh, some aspect of buffalo dung that works? particularly well if it's pregnant enough i would suppose i would think it was just sort of hiding masking the molecules that the the wasps are looking for maybe emanating from the hive uh maybe it's honey itself i don't know yeah um there was an aspect the researchers took a chemical pheromone that is applied by the hornets to the hive. They mark the hives as a target with their with their pheromones. And when the pheromone was applied to the entrance of the hives, that's when the honeybees started to apply the dung. Hmm. So okay. maybe it simply that's... masks the scent of the murder hornets. Because yeah. murder hornets don't have the little GPS dance that bees can do to communicate. No, they, they do have not. To actually, put a marker out there somewhere. Yeah, yeah. So, so very interesting. Is this tool use by bees? All I, I don't know. I just know it's pretty smart. 
Yeah. I mean, I'm the one who's always saying everything is tool use, so I'm not the one to ask. But it sounds like tool use to me. <laughs> <laughs> sounds like tool use. Let's say bees use, use tools now. It's awesome. Okay. And then the question is, how bad is the smell of these pheromones if they're like, you know, we're going to need something to cover it up. Something strong. Buffalo poo? Yeah, anything to get that pheromone <laughs> stink out of here. It's really Just that bad. Just wipe it out. Use the buffalo poo. <sighs> Oh, my goodness. This is This Week in Science. If you just tuned in, you're listening to This Week in Science or watching This Week in Science, watching or listening. One of the two. You can do both. If you are interested in a twist shirt or mug or other item of twist merchandise, head over to twist.org. Click on the Zazzle store link and you'll find our store where we have all sorts of wonderful items with the Twist logo and also with art by Blair from previous Twist calendars. Also, there's a link to buy calendars. Supplies are limited. Make sure you get your order in if you have not yet. Get them before they're gone. Get your calendar today. All right, we're going to come on back right now. Time for the COVID update. Time for the COVID update. That's Blair, if you're like me, you're getting tired of this thing. Yeah. Right? Are we all just tired? tired so tired. Of this. So, so tired. very tired. Why is it still a pandemic? Why do I have to keep doing all the things? Well, we do have to keep doing all the things to continue to protect ourselves, our neighbors, our loved ones. It is part of the process. However, some researchers at Georgia Tech decided that they wanted to take a look at the relationship, the oscillations between this psychological and physical fatigue that is wearing on people from the constant vigilance that we all have to do with the actual... Uh, the actual oscillations of the virus itself in our population. So what happens as we're moving through? Basically what they, they published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences is that if people are aware of the severity of the epidemic, they might change their behavior. And if they change their behavior there's going to be fewer severe outcomes. And so that awareness is important. But short-term awareness is basically what we're good at. Long-term vigilance is very hard, and this fatigue sets in, and the virus comes back again. So there are plateaus and oscillations that are balanced in between cautious behavior and then relaxation of that behavior. The main take-home message is that it's really important to understand that our behavior drives epidemic outcomes. <laughs> it's not just the data on how many people are infected or dying or, you know, or, or in hospital beds, in ICUs. It's not just that data that's important. It's our actions that are important because we are part of the dynamic system that is this pandemic. So please remember to be vigilant, to continue to wear your masks, to social distance, to do what you can because if you do what you can today, it's going to reduce impacts on the pandemic later. Right? Yeah, I mean, it's very easy to be like, oh, man, here we go again without taking any mm -hmm. personal responsibility, which I understand it's not fun to take personal responsibility. It's not oh. fun. I get it. <laughs> but also, clearly, a lot of people traveled for Thanksgiving. And we're not done with the spike from that event. No. And because of the delay in symptoms, in hospitalizations, it's, it's going to be with us for quite a while. And mm -hmm. we are from Thanksgiving, and then you add Christmas to it, we're going to be seeing the effects of it in our hospitals into 2021. 
It's not like, oh, there was this, and then people are going to get sick, and then it's, it'll all be better before the end of the year. It's going. Our our ICUs are going to be um, mm-hmm. are going to be impacted for a while to come. Right. Well, and because of the delay, the spike from Thanksgiving and the spike from Christmas is going to overlap with ICU time. <laughs> yes. Which is going to be really bad. It's going to be it's just, bad. You know, I, a million people have said it at this point, but I'm just going to say it again. Yes, your holidays might be sad and lonely this year, but that might be the decision that you have to make so that you can have a holiday season with your loved ones next year. Long-term thinking. Now, in terms of long-term thinking, in terms of this long-term thinking, you know, mice, we, we cure them of everything in all the research that we do. We, we cure them of depression. We cure them of things they didn't even have. Well, this is one of those things they didn't even have. Mice cannot get COVID-19. The spike protein does not recommend, recognize the mouse version of the ACE2 receptor. This is directly related to my COVID story. I can't wait to hear. Okay. Yes. So it doesn't recognize the receptor. And so, of course, researchers were like, well, we have to cure mice. So we have to give mice COVID-19. So So scientists at UCLA genetically, uh, genetically modified mice so that they have human ACE2 receptors. And then they injected them with SARS-CoV-2 and they got sick. They're looking at the effects of that sickness in the animals. They saw lost weight. They saw increases in immune cells, swelling of heart tissue, wasting away of the spleen. This is all very, very similar to what we see in humans who have COVID-19. Additionally, they looked at genes that got turned on and off in the mice that were infected. And they saw that energy generating processes had gotten turned down or turned off in the heart, kidney, spleen, and lungs. And the researchers say, if a virus snuffs out the energy-generating pathways in multiple organs of the body, that's going to totally wreak havoc. And it does. Mm -hmm. The study (laughs) revealed also that in these mice that were given human ACE2 receptors and got COVID-19, they found the virus made epigenetic changes to the structure of the DNA in the cells in those organs. And the epigenetic changes may explain the long-lasting effects of COVID-19. Because if your epigenome is getting changed, that's a a methylation or a, a twist or a turn in your DNA that shuts off certain genes from getting translated or turns them down, makes it harder for things to get turned into proteins that normally would get turned into proteins. And while this is not a study in humans, this can potentially tell us a lot about how things are working in the human systems. Anyway, so, for once, we actually gave mice something instead of <laughs> curing them of it, but it might help. So if if uh, you can in, if you can make an epigenetic change in human organs, uh, I'm wondering if this is inheritable from the children who have uh, gotten this, who may have not had, may or may not have had uh, symptoms, but have caught and survived. Although there's there's. Uh, there was a study that we didn't bring tonight. I don't think that there is a much bigger impact on children uh, than than we had initially yeah. expected. Uh, I wonder what the uh, of those changes are then inheritable uh, if this is taking place in a prepubescent uh, youth. It depends where where it infects, I would imagine, and what cell uh, what cells are affected if the epigenetic changes are in germ cells then yeah those epigenetic mm-hmm. changes could be passed on but if they're yeah if they're just in somatic body cells then it'll just it but but if they're in somatic body cells that could lead to lifelong problems and who wants to ha- a kid got a cold and now has 
a lifelong struggle with fatigue or with lung issues or heart issues. I mean, that's, yeah, no good. Yeah, Blair, what was your COVID story? So, yeah, speaking of how mice can't get COVID, this is a study out of Stanford University. So it's a bit north of where your study was taking place. Um, (laughs) They they looked at specifically why some animals are more susceptible to COVID-19 than others, which um, we've reported on a fair amount saying, okay, looks like uh, cats can get it. Oh, maybe a tiger got it. Oh, looks like maybe pigs can get it. Nope, pigs Definitely. can't get it. Uh, ferrets. Minks can get it. Ferrets yeah. can get it. Yes. So it's been kind of this constant discovery over the past year or so trying to figure out who can get COVID-19 in the animal kingdom. And so uh, right now where it stands, we know cattle, cats, weasels can get COVID-19, but others this point, pigs, chickens, for example, cannot. Um, there was a report, as I mentioned, of an infection in some tigers at a zoo, but that's still, you know, no scientific papers on that yet. Um, but as far as researchers can tell, it's all about the spike proteins to the ACE2 receptor on the surface of the animal cell. So in this study, they used computers to simulate the protein's 3D structures and investigate how the spike protein interacts with the different animals' ACE2 receptors. So basically, they just figured out which lock the key fit in and tried mm-hmm. across all these different models. Certain animals' ACE2 lock fits the key better and that these animals, including humans, are susceptible. And when they looked through their analysis, they also suggest that other species are immune because they're ACE2 lack these features. So the the key does not fit in the lock. Um, So it's a weaker interaction with spike proteins. All that's pretty consistent with what we thought so far. But this model is really what's interesting because it could aid development of antiviral strategies that uses artificial locks to trap the virus. So that would be one way to Mm. prevent the virus from infecting animal cells, have it lock to the wrong thing and prevent it from interacting with human receptors. This could also, this is the thing that I thought was very interesting, help improve models to monitor animal hosts where a virus could potentially jump to humans. So we could prevent future outbreaks by recognizing when there are these locks, these receptors that have similarities between humans and animals. If we know there is a growing infection in an animal species, you can look at the receptor that is being attacked, see if it is similar to a human receptor and batten down the hatches accordingly. So um, even though overall, it's not a whole lot of new information here, but I think really the technology is the thing that could be helpful in preventing future pandemics, or at least lessening how bad they get. Yeah. So if we already know in advance that next wave of a virus or something that comes along, if uh, we can see what it's attacking, compare it to our animal models, we can say, okay, it turns out uh, you need to keep your goldfish away from this because that (laughs) becomes i mean that wouldn't probably be an airborne but still yeah you know whatever whatever it is we could we could see what matches up ahead of time then like like we do in agriculture as it is if there's a um an outbreak of some you know foot and mouth thing or foot and hoof and uh, mouth disease or something that happens you have quarantining that takes place around (laughs) where cattle are you have quarantining precautions or you know uh, if there's an outbreak of something, uh, uh, animal shelters do this a lot. They'll have you step in bleach. Uh, mm-hmm. I can't even remember what it is that they're trying to keep from getting in or out or spreading. It's but, usually yeah. just a lot of bacteria that is through fecal matter. Yeah. But there's always, you know, you can always put that little shield of uh, precautionary uh, uh, steps around something if you know there's a problem there. And if you know in advance, if you know before there's been a huge uh, economic uh, or, or transmission uh, uh, problem, that all the better. That's fantastic. I love predictive science. I love the stuff that you can do before it happens. That's It's almost like yeah. preparing for in advance for a pandemic and having... Ooh. Let's yeah. think about, let's do that. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so there are a couple of questions that I wanted to uh, wanted to answer to talk about very 
quickly before we move into the into the next section of the show. Carol Ann is wondering if any of this is going to help a vaccine for Nipah Nipa virus as well. Uh, Fada is wondering, uh, can we remove all ACE2 receptors from humans? And then Gaurav Sharma is asking, can CRISPR modify our spike protein to be unlockable by any key? Now, CRISPR is... We could, we don't want, we don't have a spike protein. We have a receptor. So we have the ACE2 receptor in our cells. The spike protein is on the virus. I don't want to modify that spike protein. I just want to lock it up. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So just recognize it and have some kind of molecular lock that goes, nope, you're not going to recognize anything and you're not getting into my cells. Yeah, so that's, I mean, that's basically what your antibodies do, is yes. they they give this virus a big old hug. They're like, yeah. you're not going anywhere. Yeah. And then the question of whether we would want to CRISPR our ACE2 receptor, or as Fada said, remove all of our ACE2 receptors. No, no. We need you, those. <laughs> we need those. They're very, very yeah. important. Don't mess with the ACE2 rece- receptors. They are a critical part of a regulatory regulatory processes throughout the body. It's the angiotensin converting enzyme two, angiotensin renin angiotensin system, and it is involved in water balance, in blood pressure, in inflammation. It is also involved in wound healing, and it is a very essential part of of metabolism and your physiology. So let's not crisper it and let's Mm -hmm. not get rid of it. And then along the line of whether or not any of this is going to help for vaccines for Nipah virus or any other virus, yes, all of the stuff that we are learning for this SARS-CoV-2 virus is going to be information that we can apply to future viruses or to other viruses that we are already working on treatments and vaccines for so and it's very but different different viruses work differently there is a report out this week for a, a clinical trial of a f- universal flu vaccine that had very positive results it's very exciting and in the flu the flu vaccine the flu virus there's the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase two parts that's the h and the n so you have like h1 n1 H1N5, all of these conformations that are the flu virus that we're dealing with. The hemagglutinin part is the head of the structure of the molecule that our body responds to. And it's the head part of it that very often is changing and becoming different enough that our body doesn't know what to respond to. However, we have seen that there is a stalk that that hemagglutinin head is on. It's got a neck portion, and that neck portion is much more conserved. It doesn't mutate as often. And people who naturally produce antibodies to the stalk as opposed to the hemagglutinin head can have protection against multiple flu viruses. So that's what the universal flu vaccine that they're trying to create now um, is is doing. It's targeting that stock that supports the hemagglutinin head. Um, There are issues related to it, but this strategy is one of targeting these particular molecular segments that don't mutate, that don't change very much, that are potentially going to get us where we need to go. Yeah, and I think think, uh, also... Hopefully, hopefully, we have learned our lesson. Uh, I think we had the absolute worst response. Uh, and and have actually still continue to because mm-hmm. as much as everybody's seeing the light at the end of the tunnel with this vaccine on the way, or vaccines, the virus spread has never been greater. Yeah. The the daily impact has never been greater than it is now. This is the yeah. worst it's been. And yet there was they were talking about sending kids back to school in New York mm-hmm. and trying to open everything up again. There's a there's a real disconnect from reality going on mm-hmm. there. 
if well, we ever if we needed can... that shutdown, it's now until we can get to the virus because I mean, we're they're opening it up. They're opening it up because we have more tracing and testing, right? Because we have a better ability to manage when things do pop up, right? No, but wasn't the whole thing that that uh, <laughs> no, contact not tracing true. Not is like, where it's too widespread for contact tracing to work at because point, of the, yeah. the lapse in time that it takes for you to get a positive test form when infection happens. So that's absolutely yeah. untrue. It's it's um, contact tracing is useless if you are opening up and staying open. Then it's pointless. But if you're sequestering, if you're doing your mm-hmm. stay at home orders, if you're not going to grocery stores, if you're doing contactless everything. If you're wearing the masks, then knowing that a friend of a friend got it prioritizes your need to go get tested. And so the contact tracing works fantastic and is really important if we are staying as isolated uh, as possible, if we're quarantining as, as much as we possibly can. If we're not quarantining, then contact tracing is meaningless because it doesn't matter if a friend of a friend got it. You've run into 30, 40, 50, 60 other people. You're still in the same level of jeopardy whether or not you knew somebody through somebody who got the thing. So we, we are at the point where we really should be doing an actual hard shutdown now. More than March. Who cares about it? Remember when we did that couple of weeks or whatever? Back in Mar- March or whenever that was? Yeah. That was when we had like what, 20, 000, 15, 20,000 cases or what? Like we had, n- there was nothing compared to now. And now we're like, oh yeah, we got this. No, we don't. In fact, they're shutting down around the, the local area here because we're getting to the, the next county just got to that only having 15% uh, ICU capacity, uh, which is where the state has said that's when yep. you stop going to restaurants. But we're, we've been very irresponsible with it continually now. So the thing I was going to say was hopefully... We have learned from this, not just in technology, but in importance of addressing things. I think that you will see uh, financing for vaccines going forward uh, and research in these areas to be at a higher level. I think this is going to be really good for the the science community to actually get uh, to have to show the here's what can happen. They've talked about it before and stopped these things from happening, but it's taken one to actually happen for much of the world to go, oh, that's the thing they were talking about and warning about. That's why they had crews in China monitoring every emerging disease. That's why they had all these stockpiles of PCR machines. And, 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 and. Okay, so... Yep. So I, th- I think the technology going forward, we're learning a lot about how to address these things, but I think we're going to learn a lot as, as a global society to take these threats more seriously going forward. Even though we're I not still now. So. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> Maybe this is it's just... I was listening to one th- interesting thing. Somebody was commenting about the Spanish flu and the fact that our elders don't really talk about it that much. There's not a whole lot of movies about the Spanish flu. There's not a whole lot of stories that came out of that. There's not a whole lot that you would have heard from your uh, great grandparents or your grandparents about the Spanish flu, because once that thing was over, nobody wanted to talk about it ever. Again. <laughs> Let's just get past this now. And it, it could That's be right. like that could happen with COVID. We could yeah. be talking like a year or two from now. And it's like, remember that thing? Oh, I don't want to talk about it anymore. No, don't ever remind me. I can't even go to a doctor's office if they're wearing a mask. I can't even, I, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> nobody's going to want to talk about this. And that's a problem because that's how we forget. That's how we forget, but we need to be prepared. And it is time for us to prepare for the rest of our show. We got, we got some good news. We got more poo coming up in just a moment. Thank you for watching, Twists. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being a part of our audience. If you think this is great, share it with a friend. Tell someone about Twists today. All right, we're coming on back now, and you know what time it is. It's time for Blair's Panda Poo Corner. (laughs) With Blair. Loves a creature, great and small. Bipedal, millipedal, no pet at all. If you 
want to hear about animals, she's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. And a What you got, player? Well, I'm, I'm saving the panda poo for last. You're just going to have to wait. Um, but right. <laughs> first, I have a story about dog vocabularies. Uh, this is from <clears throat> Itvis Laurent University in Hungary. It's, uh, yeah. Um, and they actually they put uh, electroencephalography, EEG, uh, machines on awake dogs. These are not trained dogs. These are not research dogs. These were just family dogs. <laughs> and they wanted to see if dogs could distinguish uh, specific sounds in human speech, or if they were kind of glossing over specific things when it came to things that sounded like a particular word that they were familiar with. So the first step was to invite dogs to the lab and they let the dogs get familiar with the room and the experimenters. When the experimenters, experimenters ask the owner to sit down on a mattress with their dog and hopefully get the dog to relax. Good luck. Then the experimenters put electrodes on the dog's head, fixed it with tape. So far, sounds really relaxing to a, an average dog. Um, and then with the electrodes on, dogs listen to tape-recorded instructions of words they knew. For example, sit. They also listen to similar nonsense words like sut and to a very different nonsense word like bep, which I'm going to adopt bep into my vocabulary. I think it's an excellent word. I'm not sure what it means, but I'm going to figure it out. Anyway, it's, it's what you say when you don't want to fully say burp. It's a little bep. 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 Uh, well, what they found was that most of the dogs learn a few words throughout their lives, even if they live in a human family and are surrounded by human speech. I have lots of thoughts already about this, but anyway, we'll continue. Um, their hypothesis was that despite dogs' human-like auditory capabilities for analyzing speech, dogs might be less ready to attend to specific differences between speech sounds. So they might, for example, think sit and sut are the same word. So based on this EEG, they looked at brain activity, they looked at muscle movements, they wanted to make sure they were relaxed. They also wanted to make sure that um, they were only measuring brain stuff related to what they were listening to, basically. So that's why they were looking mm -hmm. at the muscle movements. Um, some of the dogs who came to the experiment couldn't settle down. No surprises there. I because can tell you dog. right now, my dog could not be like, okay, sure, I'll come to this brand new room full of brand new people, let you tape things to my head and just sit. Sure. No, mm -hmm. that would not happen. So anyway, <laughs> um, some of the dogs couldn't settle. They didn't get to do measurements. But here's something that's interesting. The dropout rate was similar to the dropout rate for EEG studies with human infants. <laughs> so That's funny. Yeah. So far, yeah. looking good. Uh, yeah. The dog, dog brains clearly and quickly dis, dis, um, discriminated the known words from the very different noises like sit and bep from about 200 milliseconds after the beginning of the words. So that actually is in line with similar studies on humans, which show that their, the, their brain responds differently to meaningful and nonsense words within a few hundred milliseconds. So that's so far... Dogs are doing really good. But the dog's brains made no difference at all between known words and those nonsense words that differed in a single speech sound only. So sit and sut to these dogs seem to be the same. And the pattern that they found in the EEGs were similar to human infants around 14 months old. So next time you're mad at your dog, just keep in mind they're like a 14-month-old infant with their capabilities in their brain. Um, so the, the researchers speculate that the similarity of dogs' brain activity for instruction words they know and for similar nonsense words reflects not perceptual constraints, but attention and processing biases. So dogs might not attend to all details of speech sound when they listen to words, um, but that they could find with further research whether this could be a reason that incapacitates dogs from acquiring a more sizable vocabulary. So a few things. <laughs> One is when testing household dogs, there is a huge variability in the amount of training that any particular household does with their dogs. There are mm -hmm. border collies that know 200 words. 
There are household dogs that can't even sit. And that is not the dog usually. I mean, the Border Collie thing, yes, that is extra special to that breed. It seems a lot of the the dogs that can tell, that have the largest vocabularies are Border Collie. So there's something going on there for sure. But you can tell that within even specific breeds, depending how much time you put into training a dog, they can have a much larger vocabulary and pay way better attention to their human and potential human speech based on that. So there's a lot of confounding variables here related to the home environment that this dog has and the yeah. prior training they have had. Yeah, absolutely. So there's yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, I've, uh, I've, met, uh, I've met dogs that uh, verbally could be told uh, at Christmas morning. This is a great example. At uh, Christmas morning, there's, there's this dog that they would tell it, okay, uh, it's time, go get your present. And the dog would go under the tree and sniff for the thing that smelled like a squeaky toy and yes. grab that one toy out. Yes. And then whatever it was, they would name it and they could throw that thing. And this is, I think it's just a lab, like a uh, golden lab or something. I like believe that. it, yeah. They could throw this uh, toy out with the pile of the other toys and ask for it to go get a specific toy by name, and it would go get that specific mm -hmm. toy and bring it out. So um, dogs do have this amazing capacity to to pick up words and do association with words in, in human language. Uh, that And they pick it up very quick. I found that I, for some reason I only speak Danish to dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Still haven't quite figured out why that is. Uh, but when I'm talking to a new dog and I speak Danish to it, after a while, instead of treat, it knows it's getting keeks. Uh, for, for, right? and they, they, they pick it up really quick. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of interesting how well they pick up language for the assumption that we have that they don't really use it. It could also be the sound that you're making and your body language, a combination mm -hmm. of the things. Because I, I think that helps the learning process. As Absolutely. You I think I think that absolutely like uh, like yeah you could go blah 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 and they're like uh oh yeah I, I'm sure that it's part of that learning process, but there's a point where you can remain kind of stony faced and just say the word, like if you say walk around a dog like there's people who have if you got your audio up and I'm like want to go for a walk, all their dogs are freaking out. Can I say it really loud to for Sadie? <laughs> Sadie doesn't care about that word actually. <laughs> She's she goes, but yeah, I don't I don't feel like that's it. I feel like um, the one is uh, when I tell her it's time for for dinner, <laughs> she starts barking. Um, okay, I'm excited. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so I think I think the main thing that I if I can try to interpret this a little bit more, I think what yeah. they're they're trying to get at is dogs don't have complex language skills to the extent that you know they could understand the nuance of complete sentences. And like, I think that's really what this is about is that in order to master a language, you need to understand variance on words. And uh, it's way more complex than something that say a toddler can understand. So I think that's kind of what this is starting to get at is like, this is really cool. Dogs seem to have language understanding about at the level of a 14 year old, 14 month old <laughs> infant. Um, and so, yes, we don't expect them to get to a five or 10 year old because they're they're never going to be able to create complex language themselves with our vocabulary. So, yeah, it could, I, it could right. Not with our vocabulary. They're not going right. to use our words. They're not going to they're they're not an Alex the parrot. Exactly. Yes. So it, it's definitely. They're on the spectrum though, right? Like yeah. there are some dogs that are really close to Alex the parrot because they have the same recognition of him where they could understand yellow car. Yes. But yeah, so I, I think it's a little more complicated than the story, but I think it's an interesting study in using dogs that are not specially trained, which I think is a great first step in uh, trying to just figure out what the average dog understands. It's very cool. Uh, yeah. But also uh, really taking a good look at language recognition so for all of you out there that think you have really well-trained dogs maybe it's time to start messing around telling them to sut and see what happens <laughs> or, I, i'm gonna do it and i'm gonna see what happens i think it's gonna be very interesting 
Or, or you know what? Like, how much vocabulary have you actually tried to teach your dog? Yeah. Like, how much time have you spent? Do you read to your dog at night? <laughs> you do that with kids. That's how they pick up have their you vocabulary. Done training? Maybe yes. you I do talk to her a cup. lot. I do. I do have yes. like full narratives, which is great. I really like having a dog because you know, with my husband working nights, so he he's asleep during the day. And especially now that I'm working from home, I'm just walking around the house by myself, talking to myself, talking myself through my day. And having a dog here means I can tell her about my day and it's a lot less insane. And so, yes, she gets a constant um, dialogue for me. But And and much safer than having a cat. <laughs> yes, for sure. sure. That's true. We just haven't, we just haven't found out about, about all the diseases that dogs carry that they give to humans. Yes. Because they have bigger poos. Sure. Yes. This is my transition to your next yes. story. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh huh. I want to tell you about HMR in giant pandas. What's HMR, you ask? I have no idea. Oh, I'd love to tell you. It is horse manure rolling. Horse manure rolling by giant pandas. This is something that um, the Chinese Academy of Sciences have worked with Beijing Zoo to study. In a decade-long study, looking at HMRs in giant pandas. Why does this have its own acronym, you ask? <laughs> it's because about 10 years ago, the research team observed a giant panda in the wild, pausing and rolling itself in a large pile of horse manure. Intrigued! They began watching for other observations. And over the past decade, they documented, documented, documented 38 instances of HMR by wild giant pandas. Hence, wow. needing the acronym. It happens a lot. Was this the same weird panda over and over, you ask? No. <laughs> it was dozens of them. They were not just rolling in manure. They were working very hard to cover their entire bodies in the feces. And it was only in cold months, specifically cold when temperatures months. dropped below 15 degrees Celsius. And it's it's, it's uh, specifically horse manure? Or is that just... Specifically fresh, fresh horse, horse. manure. <laughs> Um, oh, so, this is a big question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why would you do that? Why indeed? <laughs> so they suggest that the bears are benefiting from the manure somehow related to the cold. So they studied the manure, as you do. Pandas only, as I said, only bothered with fresh manure. They found in this fresh horse manure, or F. HM, if I may coin a term, uh, two chemicals, beta carophylline and carophylline oxide. They are aromatic, they smell, and they dissipate quickly. They applied the chemicals to hay in the panda enclosures in the Be Beijing Zoo, and they found that the pandas also liked it, but only when it was chilly. Next, they tested it with mice. And they found that the, it made the mice less averse to cold conditions. So let me remind everyone. Bears, they're good at the cold. That's like one of the things about bears. Think about polar bears, right? <laughs> um, so I can't help but wonder if part of this is because they're supposed to be eating meat, but they're sitting there eating bamboo. Are they not as good at staying warm because they're not consuming fat? I don't know, just a question, not studied in this, in this particular research. But this is the crux of it, is that they found these two chemicals. They were, again, they were aromatic, they dissipated quickly. They gave the pandas and mice, they think, a feeling of warmth, similar to Vicks VapoRub, because it was <laughs> aromatic and it dissipated quickly. It doesn't help them stay warm. It does nothing, nothing to help them stay warm. It just takes the sting out of the cold air because of the sensation. 
How long does the sensation last? I mean, they have to go find fresh manure to roll in on a regular basis. It cannot be long. I mean, think how long, how does your Vicks Vapo rub last? Probably like a half an hour, hour, right? Maybe. But, but that's yeah. direct to skin. So I would guess it's actually way less than that. Oh, pandas. Guys, you're just bad at everything. And now you don't even look like oh. pandas because oh you put God. so much poo on your fur, you, you, you're brown. You're literally <laughs> covered in poo. Do you understand? <laughs> Yeah. Just how can I be more of a panda? Let me think. Why? I'm going to cover myself in poop. <laughs> Make myself more of a useless critter. Let me just. Mm. No, no, no. I mean, alliteration. Uh, cover is myself in poop. I know it'll make everyone like me. Poop. <laughs> cover myself in poop. <laughs> Manure. Yes. Anyway. How weird. Yeah. A animals animals are fascinating. Oh boy. Yeah, that's Why? a word just, for it. Are these are these all the bears or just individuals? I mean dozens. Dozens, yeah. Dozens. Hmm. All right. There's more to that story. There's, <laughs> there's gotta be. I can't wait to hear more about the poop covered pandas. Perhaps in twenty twenty one. <laughs> Research update. Oh, Pandas boy. roll in poo because they think it looks news at cool. 12. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Guess what, Pandas? You're wrong. <laughs> oh, boy. But our listeners are not wrong to be listening to This Week in Science. Thank you for listening to This Week in Science once again for bringing us into your ears, into your brains, and hopefully into your thoughts for the rest of the week as you contemplate the stories from this show. Reminder, calendars are available for 2021. Blair's Animal Corner calendars are available now at the TWIST website. Head to twist.org to order yours today. While you're there, you can also click on our Patreon link. Patreon is a is where it's our community of supporters, people who support our endeavors to bring science and curiosity and wonder to the world, to share science with you and with others. If you appreciate the show and want to help us continue to do what we do, click on that Patreon link and select your level of support. We have now started annual memberships. And there is a discount for becoming an annual member if you are interested in just paying once as opposed to monthly. But yes, annual memberships now available at Patreon. We thank you for your support. Really can't do it without you. All right, Justin, what do you have to say for science? Uh, so this is actually uh, not me saying this, but this is uh, a... A letter, a sort of, it's called a call to action, marshalling science for society that was put together by current and past presidents of the American Institute of Biological Sciences. Uh, we're going to have a link in the show notes with the actual, uh, them saying all of the words, uh, but it's pretty long. I have an abridged version, but I did want to read their statement because it, it's reminiscent of a collage of uh, disclaimers uh, <laughs> on the show uh, over the years. Uh, but here it goes. We find the assault by pol politicians and special interest groups on the use of scientific knowledge to guide public policy decision making alarming and dangerous. The marginalization of scientific information and decision making has significant negative effects on our public health and safety, our environmental sustainability, and our general well-being. We need not look further than the disruption and deaths that have resulted in many countries, including the United States, from failing to use scientific evidence in making decisions on how to control COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, many politicians in the United States and around the world have continued to spread misinformation to promote goals they consider desirable. In the face of this problem, all policy, all policy should be based on sound science 
and its application to dealing with any policy of consequence, including those that address the existential threats to civilization. Uh, they go on to explain how science works. <laughs> Very like, here's what we do kind of a way. Uh, they illustrate the failure of politicians to follow or amplify scientific guidance in the face of COVID-19, which uh, leaving the public to be open to suggestion and opinion that they hear as opposed to the sound knowledge of expertise and, uh, and research and doctors. Uh, going on, the progress of science over the centuries has led to our deep understanding of natural phenomena. We must find ways to benefit from that understanding as we move into the future. Let us join together. Scientists of the world unite! There it is. Let us join together to insist on acting logically and rationally in a world so plagued by self-centered short-term goals and the false information that they all too often generate. So this is, uh, again, American Institute of Biological Sciences. They get involved in things like debunking bad information or misinformation about science and promoting good science. Uh, it's a wonderful organization. You should definitely check it out. Put the full version, a link to the full version, as well as uh, the audio. They sort of did an audio collage of past and present uh, presidents of the organization saying those words and more. Uh, but I think that's a very important thing. It's something we've, uh, you know, we've talked about a lot about science, the scientific community, putting their voice out there more forcefully, speaking louder. And I, and I hope, again, as much as I think we've learned for, uh, a lesson or two or many from this pandemic that we're still at the height of. Uh, we, so we haven't learned the lesson because we're still at the height of and we still haven't taken action. But hopefully the scientific community goes, oh, okay, this is our job and that's we need to be more dedicated to, <laughs> to that than to caring what a politician thinks. And it's a political right. world, so it's difficult, but there needs to be, there needs to be more expertise in policymaking because we can't do this again. We can't keep doing this. We can't keep following this path. It's, it's a dead end there. And then, oh yeah, uh, Talking about using scientific data in policymaking, uh, armored personnel carriers, long-range acoustic devices, uh, LRADs, assault rifles, submachine guns, flashbang grenades, grenade launchers that go with them, sniper rifles with night vision scopes are not military equipment. Uh, well, they are military equipment, but these are just a few of the toys local police have been equipping themselves with while dressing up like soldiers uh, in tactical gear and flak jackets to go and helmets and riot gear to go interact with the public. New research shows that the militarization of local law enforcement through all these armors and combat attire and uh, weapons does not reduce crime. There's not even a correlation of crime reduction with militarization of police. Additionally, researchers found that the evidence that the police use to say that they need equipment is full of discrepancies. Uh, they're creating their own data, uh, in a sense, to say that they need things, which is absolutely unscientific and unreliable. It says here, scholars rely on accurate data to track and analyze the true effects of police militarization on crime. Policymakers also need accurate data to base their decisions upon. However, to date... We do not have reliable data on how the surplus military equipment transfers to local police and sheriffs through our federal government and is used. This is uh, LSU Department of Political Science Assistant Professor Anna Gunderson, who's the lead author in the paper, which was published in Nature Human Behavior. So much of the militarization was stopped after the, uh, the police brutality protest in Ferguson in 2014. And then that decision was reversed in 2017. And we saw what we saw over just this last <laughs> summer. One of the things that they looked at, they looked at some data releases that were showing uh, how the use uh, of, of these, this military equipment within law enforcement 
data was released in 2014. There was another record released in 2018, and they found that the 2018 data didn't even match the 2014 data in terms of going back and saying what these departments had. Researchers then concluded drawing, uh, that the promoting claims about the efficacy of police militarization, especially crime rates based on research relying on these data releases by the Department of Defense and local police departments, was absolutely and totally unreliable. When they conducted their own analysis using updated data, combining all the data from all these different sources, authors find no evidence that the military equipment transfers from the Department of Defense to local municipalities, police departments, and sheriff's departments, there was no reduction of crime, contrary to what uh, these locals are saying and asking for their toys. So, yeah, uh, we need policy making that uh, <laughs> is based on reality. You know, if you Good let data. If you let anyone make a Christmas list and say, okay, but you have to show a need for your Christmas list, eh, they'll probably come up with some reasons why they need it. That's why you need like a third party to actually analyze these things and see see if there's something actually, see if there's a there there. And we, we did see, I think, a tremendously frightening use of militarized force against peaceful protesters. I mean, it's one thing if you have gotten these things, you're thinking the, the, the terrorists are coming, it's Red Dawn, the Russians are going to parachute in from the, uh, you know, all that's going to happen. You want uh, some backup response for it for in the locals. Okay, put that in a vault somewhere. Train with it once a year, whatever. But they're busting all of this out on peaceful protesters. So obviously there's a very big difference between what they said they needed it for and what they used it for. They, yeah. And what they said they needed it for, it didn't do anything. It didn't work. So roll it back. Send it all back. You don't need a tank to stop petty crime, petty theft. You don't they need... Got, they, <laughs> they got one in Davis. They got one of these armored uh, Armored vehicles, yeah. And they got an MCAT yeah. in the little college town, happy, like, low crime rate town of Davis, California. Yeah. And, and the people, when they found out, like, it was hush-hush. Like, nobody knew that the police department just went out and asked for it, and they got it. The town made them give it back or give it away. The town, <laughs> like, like, the people no. were like, no, no, you're no. not driving that around our town no you yeah. absolutely can't have that toy and that's exactly what it was it was a toy it's so that they could play soldier it's just very frightening mm. it is frightening yeah i mean i think it 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 the management of of these things how how violence works how crime works gun fatalities you know all all of these things understand having the data to make better decisions will be very helpful having people in place to use the data to make better decisions will yeah, you're be pointing out you're pointing out it's, it's yeah. glassed over but yeah the cdc hasn't been allowed to collect data on gun accident gun fatalities yeah. uh, police departments don't always uh, report when they have uh, the information about people that they have interacted with that ended lethally uh, they don't make the same reports there that they do if they arrest somebody it's uh, less paperwork in fact like, yeah almost, but then it's like, the question of you know what do who what what do we want the police to be doing? What is their role, hmm. their job in society? And that is a, that is a, uh, you know, local question for localities. But it's something that people should be thinking about. And most police departments for. spend a, a, a very yeah. low amount of time dealing with violent crime or crime itself. Uh, I mean, outside of, you know, there's a lot of. Uh, what do they call it? misdemeanor kind of stuff for traffic violations or responding to somebody's parked in front of a driveway, stuff like that. I think that we need police in a society. That's absolutely something that we need. But I don't think that they need to be trained that the way that they are. Um, yeah. Unless we're yeah. really the worst country in the world and need to be the highest imprisoned and need the half of every city's budget to go to policing us because we're just that big of a criminal society. In which case, we need to change everything about what Well, in which about. case, we shouldn't be going to other countries and trying to help them sort things out. So that's a whole nother thing. 
Oh, geez. These are big issues that should be discussed <laughs> after the show. <laughs> All the, This is a rabbit hole. This is a rabbit hole for personal opinions and discussions. So let's move on to my last couple of stories. I have brains to talk about because we like using our brains. Mm -hmm. I love my brain. And even in the wintertime, I'm using my brain and I'm trying to keep my brain healthy by learning new things, trying new skills, trying to, you know, I exercise, I keep my brain fit, strong. I try to keep it from withering away and shrinking like the shrew's brain. I had no idea. According to a study out in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, there are shrews, the Etruscan shrew and uh, is one of them, but also a, a different group of shrews as well. They... They lose their brains in the wintertime. Their brains <laughs> shrink. They, there is a small, there is a group of shrews, the red, the red toothed shrews. And those shrews, their whole body shrinks down. The red toothed shrews in the, they, they grow a little bit after they're born in the summer season. And then in the fall, winter, Everything shrinks, and it is a cycle called Danelle's phenomenon. These shrews just shrink away, and then in the spring they don't they don't hibernate. And then in the spring, everything starts growing back again. They get big and strong. They eat lots of food, and then they mate, and then they die. Right, and that's what happened. They just ah oh, to be a way. shrew. Yes. No, thank you. <laughs> oh yes. All right, so. Researchers wanted in in Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin, La Crosse, wanted to know whether other shrew species, excuse me, also had this brain shrinking phenomenon. And they discovered that, yes, indeed, the Etruscan shrew, which is not related in the same shrew group to the red toothed shrew, <laughs> it also has a shrinking brain. But it's very specific. Very specific. I don't, I don't know if I like the fact. I mean, this is our our line of animal on the planet. Aren't we like originating from a shrew? We or originated from a from a, a thing that was like a shrew, but not not really. The shrew still, well, you know. I wanted. Have we really checked brains shrinkage? Do we check brain size? That I mean, much it, in human it seasonal brain. Things. Yeah. yeah. Do, we, do humans do have it. seasonal brain shrinkage? Maybe we should look into it. Well, but they're doing like brain slices and stuff, probably to do. They're pulling out the brains, probably to measure them in these shrews. Mm -hmm. I, I don't imagine that it's an easy experiment to do on humans these days. No. no. But they didn't pull these brains out of the shrews. They stuck them in little tiny MRIs. Oh, good. <laughs> Magnetic oh, that's, that's resonance imaging sc scanning, and they looked at 10 shrews over a year. Each season, they scanned their brains and looked at brain volume and at uh, thickness in different areas of the brain over time. And they discovered that the brain volume in these Etruscan shrews decreases in the winter, even though they kept the animals under 12 hour light and dark cycle. So 12 hours light, 12 hours are dark. These shrews shouldn't have known that it was winter, but their bodies did and their brains shrank. It's because they were counting down to, to sex and then death, right? Isn't that <laughs> yes, the whole? They the countdown. I only have a year. I have to yeah. follow this pattern. I only have a year. This is it. It's the countdown. They also gave unlimited food to the animals during that time period and had a very consistent temperature. So there was no temperature swing, no other cues that would potentially make the body's metabolism want to conserve energy or resources by shrinking the brain. And it indicated that this whole thing is related to internal cues as opposed to external cues. In a different group, they gave them they they took away some of their food in the summertime and then they were able to find out that there was a decrease in brain thickness then as well 
So there are cues like food availability that will influence the the resources in the body and where they go um, in these shrews. But they're internal, internal, internal clocks that really drive the shrews and their brain size. They found a layer of the somatosensory cortex decreased in its its thickness by 28% in the wintertime and then grew right back the following summer. And the question is now, we know in mice and rats, and we have some evidence that we've talked about on the show over the years about where new cells get, uh, where new cells in the brain come from. Mm -hmm. And so they now are going to start looking at the hippocampus of these shrews to see whether or not the cells originate in the hippocampus when the brains grow back to their thickness to try and figure out exactly what's going on there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So then, uh, then we're talking about if uh, somebody has, I don't know, fallen on a spike that went through their eye and came out the back of their head, but they survived and they're missing a bunch of their brain matter now because of this accident, but the plasticity has allowed them to continue going on their lives. Is this potentially a brain regeneration? Right. The therapy thing? That How's can it working? From yes. this? Because I don't know of anything that's just been like, ah, I'm going to get rid of a bunch of brain and I'll put a quarter of it back again. I know, it's no big deal. Like regrowing a tail on a, on a lizard or something. Just regrowing brain tissue. I didn't know that was an option. Right. Because and then, so now if we're looking at it beyond, we've seen it in, in mice and rats, but to see this seasonal growth in a shrew, yeah. that's a, another mammalian species that gives it uh, some robustness. Yeah. Yeah, it's in the it's in the family tree somewhere. We're distant, distant, distant cousins. But the but then the thing is too, you know, maybe maybe you've gotten this far in life and you're you're not happy with the brain that you have. You're like, ah, maybe I want to, you know, roll the dice a little. See see what would happen if kind of got rid of a quarter of this brain <laughs> and let it regrow back. Maybe maybe that brain will work better than the one I've started with. Yeah. Like there's all sorts a, of... Yeah, it's a huge question, though, of, you know, what is happening to them in the winter that, uh, you know, ha- is their cognition, is their yeah. ability to yeah. think, <laughs> to well, to function, is it impaired when, when their brain is less thick? When and that you could totally test all this, record- right? You, yeah, you could test memory all... and behavior exactly. from from uh, one summer to the next. Yeah. Teach the shrews a bunch of stuff uh, this summer and see if they retain it uh, after the brain is shrunk and grown back again. See if their personalities change in any way. Now I'm really fascinated with how shrews are from year to year. Are they like completely different shrew the next year? Or is it just like... Yeah. I can't remember where I put my keys, but that's okay. I don't I'm, I don't drive. I'm a shrew. So it's no that's cool. Deal. I'm a shrew. I was one, one shrew in the fall and I'm a completely new shrew in the spring. Look at me now. Yeah. The shrew takes Manhattan. It's gonna That's be the next amazing. Pixar movie. Yeah, the so these were little, doing that much. little teeny tiny shrews. There's a lot, a go- lot more going on than maybe we had thought. They lose almost a quarter of their neurons. It's, it's in their somatosensory cortex. It's huge. It's massive. Um, and then moving on from shrew brains to how we remember where and when things take place. There are two studies out this last week, uh, both of them led by University of Texas Southwestern and one published in the Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences, another in Science, that are adding to what we understand about space and time and memory in our brain. Time cells are cells in the brain. They've been discovered in rats. They have a pattern of firing that's like a clock, and they fire, and they fire, and they fire. It's this very regular firing. And this reproducible firing sequence of this activation of the brain is controlled by 5 hertz brain waves that are called theta oscillations. And the process is called precession. And the researchers at UT Southwestern wanted to know 
whether people also have these time cells. And in their study, they used a memory task that involved time-related information. Um, they measured the brain's hippocampus, hippocampal region in epileptic patients. So these were people with epilepsy who were going in for surgery on their brains. So their brains were going to be opened up anyway. And during that time that it was open before the surgery actually took place, they had them do some free recall experiments, reading a list of 12 words for a certain amount of time, like 30 seconds, and then doing a quick math problem to distract them from remembering and rehearsing the lists and then try and do that re uh, that recall of the lists over again for another 30 seconds. And it there is a word that is associated with each segment of time. So this, the list is within a certain 30 seconds. The next 30 seconds is recall. Another 30 seconds, you're going to have to recall some words. And so it's this timed memory. And lo and behold, time cells in the human hippocampus. We have firing cells that if they fire more reliably, they actually predict better how well you remember things related to a particular time. And they call that temporal clustering. So just like in rats, people have time cells. And then in science, they also looked at hippocampal cells, looked at place cells. Place cells are cells that fire when you are in a place. And these cells are, are activated when you go to a new place and they fire in a particular sequence. And it's been hypothesized that these place cells are what really help you remember spatial locations. In the, in the brain, they're kind of like these, it's like a sweep of, of a spot. They will fire before an animal, this is being recorded in rats, they fire before an animal will go into a space. And then they also fire as a review of what was just seen in that place. And the, the researchers determined that there is this forward and backward playing of these cells that alternate back and forth. And the researchers say, while the animals are moving forward, their brains were constantly switching between expecting what's going to happen next, place cells that are just learning a location, and then those place cells firing again in the exact same sequence, recalling what just happened. And it happens within a split second, fraction of a second time frames. So your brain, when you're going into new places, potentially, this is in rats, not in humans, but potentially, when you're entering and exploring a new place, you can imagine that you have a little neural radar in your brain that's going, boop, 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 boop. what's here? Oh, boop, 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 that's what's there. Boop, 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 boop. what's in this, this next spot? Boop, 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 boop. Oh, that's what's in that spot. Okay, re we're going to play it. We're going to figure it out. Okay, we're going to replay it. We're going to remember it. Looking forward and looking back. And our brain has these cells that are constantly active, telling us where we are and when we are. Combining both of those mm -hmm. stories, uh, me and a friend play this game where you say a movie, and then the other person has to get guess what year it came out. And you, you go, any movie, any so era, bad at that. But during that has to be during our lifetime. <laughs> no right? recall. Has to be during, we don't go back and try to do the fifties or something. We do our lifetime kind of a movies. Like, um, and what's funny is. The way that I remember when a movie came out is where I saw it and who I was with. And those two things, who I went to the movie. If I went mm -hmm. to a movie alone, I guess I don't remember it. Because I remember where I saw the movie and who I watched that movie with. And that's usually enough to narrow down the year or two uh, right. when that movie came out. So that's that's really interesting because it's immediately what made it like that's how my brain absolutely works. It remembers things in time based on the the room that I was in and the individual next to me. Hmm. Yeah, our brain is this amazing association processor. So if you've got these regular time time marking cells 
firing in your brain and you have the place cells checking to see where you are and you have other cells that are recognizing people around you and your brain is taking all that information in and putting it together in these split, these these slices of rea- creating slices of reality where these they're networks of neurons firing together the time cell, the place cell, the face cell, you know, all firing together to put a memory into your brain where you can go, oh, that was that theater on D Street and it was this person and it was this movie in 1992. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's very, it, the brain, the inner workings. At some point, we'll be able to, I don't know, at some point, we'll understand it. And I, and I, that's, I, it's, I that's and amazing it, to me. I think those spaces must be uh, stored pretty close together, at least in my brain. Because I will dream where I am walking from one actual known location to another to another, all within that dream. But they're all physical, actual spaces. It's not like making up new architecture. My brain's lazy. It just grabs from it. Oh, we need a new room? Let's grab this one from uh, the house you lived in when you were seven years old. Okay, we'll make that the next room. And then you walk through, and it's like, oh, here's the high school you went to. We'll make that the next thing that you walk through. I'm still. Should I keep stalling? Kiki, you look like you're really looking hard for something. I was really looking hard for something because I had a letter from a listener that I had entered into the show rundown. I didn't see one. That suddenly is not there anymore. Oh, yeah. I was looking for one. I didn't so, see one. yeah, it was there and now it's gone. And I don't know why it's not there. So is it on now... a different day? Mm, nope. I don't think so. Oh, the little things, those details. You're doing a show, trying to make a thing go, and then something disappears. Where did it go? Where did the letter go? But it was a correction. It really is what it was. Hmm. And let's see. We have my inbox, and I can read it. Did we get something wrong? We did. That happens from time to time. We did get something wrong. It was a very kind letter from Jennifer Herricks, who wrote in to say, Hello, Twist Team. On the last episode, I heard you mention at the end that we no longer need to get polio vaccines. However, we do still receive polio vaccines, as polio still exists in the world. We live in the United States, and both of my kids were recently immunized against polio. And that that's absolutely true. There is still a polio vaccine. I think you were thinking of smallpox. I probably was, yeah. Which was globally eradicated yeah, thanks you're to right. vaccines. That's exactly what I was thinking of, yep. Because of the polio vaccines, we are close to eradicating polio, which is still endemic in Pakistan and Afghanistan. Oh. Thanks for the great show on science. Thank you for catching that, Jennifer. Um, yeah. Sometimes doing a live show, we say, we, we say things and we get it wrong when we're using our yep. fallible human memories <sighs> yes as opposed to things that are written down in front of us but i appreciate the correction and it's it's an important one to make but uh the point still being that you know at this point in time we don't worry about smallpox anymore mm-hmm. because vaccination made it disappear and for a large part we really don't have to worry about polio here in the united states uh thanks to vaccination there are Wonderful, and, and and that was, I think, the bit the big point that that you were trying to make, Blair, in yep. that that comment. Yeah, but yeah. accuracy is very important, and so yes, everyone, polio vaccines. Your children probably have had polio vaccines. If you had children, you've probably had a polio vaccine. You mm-hmm. probably have not had a smallpox vaccine. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Probably not. Any more thoughts before the end of the show, friends? No? All right. So. No? Let's have an end to this show. We're going to bring it to the end. We've done it. Thank you for listening. Thank you for joining us. I do hope that you enjoyed the show. Shout out to Fada for help with social media and show notes. Gord, thank you for manning the chat room. And Identity4, thank you for 
recording the show. Hopefully, the uh, show recording didn't go so long that we totally got things deleted and uh, things didn't work out last week. Things were crazy all uh, over the place. What are you talking about? What? What am I talking about? I'm talking about things about not being prepared again. <sighs> We, had, we we dropped some of our uh, show last uh, last week, did we? It was the after show that was oh, dropped. Right. Yes. All right, let me open up. Let me open up the thank yous because, of course, I didn't have that open either. End of the show. I got to be ready for this stuff. So I what guess, is going on? I guess if the oh, end computer of the... crashy problem. We had a lot of computer crashies last week. I guess if oh, the sure. end of the, I guess if the after show uh, got cut off last week, I guess I don't need to apologize then <laughs> for the <laughs> profanity laced rant that I went on for I think half an hour was it? It was it was the, a long one. <laughs> I guess, uh, I, guess I, could, uh, I can save that one for for a future yeah. apology when, when I I'm, really need one. I, I I like that you're passionate. Passion is important in life. It is important. So now I would like to say thank you. Thank you to the Burroughs Welcome Fund and also to our Patreon sponsors for their generous support of This Week in Science. Thank you to Woody MS, Andre Bassett, Chris Wozniak, Dave Bunn, Vegard Chefstad, Hal Schneider, Donathan Stiles, a.k.a. Don Stylo, John Scioli, Guillaume, John Lee, Ali Coffin, Gorov, Sharma, Shubru, Sarah Forfar, Darwin Hannon, Donald Lee Mundus, St- Stephen Alberon, Daryl Myshak, Stu Pollock, Andrew Swanson, Fred S. 104, Sky Luke, Paul Ronovich, Bentley, The Translator, Big Nell, Kevin Reardon, Noodles, Jack, Brian Carrington, Matt Bass, Joshua Fury, Sean and Nina Lamb, John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Hessenflow, Gene Tellier, Steve Leesman, a.k.a. Zima, Ken Hayes, Howard Tan, Christopher Rappin, Richard, Brendan Minish, Melisande, Johnny Gridley, Kevin Railsback, Flying Out, Richard Porter, Christopher Dreyer, Mark Mazaros, RDM, Greg Briggs, John Atwood, Conrad Michaels is a Russian super spy, Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Rodney Lewis, Paul, Matt Sutter, Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Matt Mountain Sloth, Jim Drapo, Sarah Javis, Al- Alex Wilson, John Ratnaswamy, Sue Doster, Jason Olds, Dave Neighbor, Eric Knapp, E.O., Kevin Parachan, Aaron Luthen, Steve DeBell, Bob Calder, Marjorie, Paul Stanton, Paul Disney, Patrick Pecoraro, Ben Rothig, Gary S., Tony Steele, Ulysses Adkins, Brian Condren, Jason Roberts, and Dave Friedel. Thank you for all of your support of Twists on Patreon. And if you are interested in supporting us on Patreon, please click the Patreon link at twist.org. Org. On next week's show. We will be back Wednesday, Pacific Time, 8 p.m. broadcasting live from our YouTube and Facebook channels and from twist.org slash live. I don't know how we're getting to all those places at once, but we're going to be in all of them. It's magic. Uh, if you want to listen to us as a podcast, you can search for This Week in Science wherever podcasts are found. So figure it out yourself, I guess. If you enjoyed the show, get your friends to subscribe as well. And if you'd like more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes and links to the stories will be available on our website, www.twis.org. And you can also sign up for a newsletter that apparently we've started. It'll it'll come. You can contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at thisweekinsides.com, Justin at twistmedian at gmail.com, or me, Blair, at blairbaz at twist.org. Just be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, in that subject line or your email will be spam filtered all the way into Justin and my quarantine birthday cake. (laughs) If you want to tweet at us, you'd have to go to Twitter where we are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes due in the night, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember... It's all in your head. This Week in Science This Week in Science This Week in Science 
this week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Cause this week's science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I I use the scientific method for all that it's worth And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science Science, science. science. This week in science This week in science this week in science, 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news That what I say may not represent your views But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan If you listen to the science you may just yet understand That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy, jeopardy, jeopardy. And this week in science is coming your way so everybody listen to everything we say And if you use our methods instead of rolling a die We may rid the world of toxoplasma Gandhi Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science Science, science. science. This week in science This week in science This week in science Science Science, science. Got a laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got So how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week This week in science is coming your way You better just listen to what we say And if you learn anything from the words that we said then please just remember it's all in your head cause it's this week in science this week in science this week in science 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 science, 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 science. this week in science this week in science this week in science science science, 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 science. this week in science this week in science this week in science this week in science this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, this week in science. So Blair, I love your decorations in the background. It's very holiday, holiday spirit over there. Nice. It's it's Hanukkah birthday Christmas at your house. It yeah. always is. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the the mention, the brief mention was made of birthday cake in the end of uh, the, the spam filtered into your quarantine <laughs> birthday cakes. Yes, 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 the, yes. And, yeah, 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 yeah. If people don't remember, if you're not looking at your twist calendars, it is Blair and Justin's birthdays within this next week. They will have passed by the time we have our show next week. I hope not. <laughs> I mean, the birthday days okay, all right. will have passed. <laughs> Just the days. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, 2020 so, birthdays don't count, right? I'm still focusing on that. <laughs> yeah, no. Tw birthdays in 2020, you can have your birthday. It doesn't count. You're not actually getting another year older. Right. I didn't use this one. <laughs> you didn't you didn't use this year exactly. You can't get another year older. Or maybe you will get a uh do we do we did we all age a decade this year? Yeah, maybe. That what, yeah. I just I do think it's very funny. I like think back on like March, right? Like March, April, May. Like uh people had birthdays. They're like, oh man, I'm so sorry you had to have a quarantine birthday. This sucks. Let me make this extra special for you. 
And, you know, I'm sitting here with the December birthday, like, Psh, it won't hit me. <laughs> like, I'm so sorry that you had to deal with this. That really sucks. Yep. And then, uh, then here we are. And uh, not only is it still happening, but it was actually better for a minute. And then it got terrible again right before. So that's yeah. fun. <laughs> At least you got to get married. That is the yeah, good Yeah, that's true. I did get to get married. I didn't get to have my wedding. Didn't get to wear my dress. But not, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. It'll happen. It'll, It'll happen. happen. 2021. Yeah. Um, so every everyone, if you have the time, the eleventh and the twelfth, be sure to send birthday greetings to Justin and Blair as their birthdays oh, will be here. Yeah. 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 I forgot. <laughs> I remember, like, the day before yesterday, Yay! Brian brought working. it up, and I was like, oh, what? yeah. <laughs> what day is it? Oh, cool. Uh, I literally forgot. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I do think this is a year off. I think yeah. we should just. Yeah. We should just I mean, all take it off. I'll just do this year age over again. Might take mm -hmm. a few of them. We're about mm -hmm. to have our 45th president. That's exciting. Um. You know, what? we're doing a lot of resets. <laughs> Are we getting forty our forty fifth president I, I over think again? So. Is that That's what, you what said? I'm counting. I'm, <laughs> gonna call, I'm calling this one forty five. Yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, no, that's funny. Sadie's got back. Yeah. Oh my goodness! Actually, we did. We took her to the vet because she's a year old now, and um, they were like, "She's chunk." Go for more they, walks. So it's funny too because I I have been very careful because corgis are prone to being overweight and not just that, but them being overweight is what contributes to their number one health issue, which is back and neck related. Hmm. Um, because of the shape of their body, they're so long that like Wait, all they it, are is back and neck. Exactly, that's the problem, right? So if they're heavy, then that's like pulling on their spine, and it causes them disc problems. So. Um, Anyway, I've been like very careful and I've been paying close attention and, you know, all of my time at the zoo doing body scoring on animals. I keep like looking her from the top, like, can I see a dip? Like looking her from the side, like, ah, I don't know. But also corgis are shaped so weird mm -hmm. that it's really, it's, it's extra hard to tell. So anyway, point is she needs to lose a little bit of weight. <laughs> <laughs> Your little child. Just a little. She's but so but it's she's already we we run for two and a half miles every morning and then I take her for like a mile long walk in the evening. So it's not so much the exercise, I think. I think it's the food. But it's also yeah. funny because according to her weight and age, she should be getting, I think, gosh, almost twice the amount of food that we're giving her, according to like what it says on the back of a, a dog food bag. But be, Don't again, listen to the dog food bags. The right. dog food bags want you to feed and feed and feed and buy more dog food bags. Sure. But also yeah. it's, you know, again, her shape is so bizarre. It's it's very yeah. different from a oh, year old 30 pound dog that's proportionate. <laughs> right. Anyway. Kuarov asks, what's the evolutionary advantage to being shaped like oh, a corgi? Oh, that's actually a really good question. So again, it's not evolutionary, it's engineered. It's right? people. Yes. It's people engineering. But it's so that when they herd cattle, they don't get kicked in the head. Oh. Oh, because yeah. they're so short. Yes. I oh. thought they would have been like burrowing after like something. No, 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 no. Cold they're too thick, I think, oh. for that. But huh. uh, yeah, it's for herding. Interesting. Yeah. That is very interesting hurting yeah which she does on our run she she nips at my ankles a little bit although it although it uh, Grav, Grav, it is uh Grav, it is fun to think about dogs as being uh evolutionarily natural i'm trying to fix i always picture the the big herd the giant herd of chihuahuas that once <laughs> in mass would take yeah. down bison yeah. on the great plains um, well, that's like when I, I used to teach about uh, guinea pigs. They're, the uh, montane guinea pig or the Patagonian cabbie are both like relatives of the domestic guinea pig. And they 
um, run in herds, in giant herds, so that uh, the it's like being a school of no, fish. Like if there's yeah. a predator coming, and yeah, they, absolutely, um, run in herds. Sorry. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow, that was so weird. You responded to yourself because you said they run in herds, and then you said absolutely. Oh, Blair, you're right. We should just they do. do. They run in. Show. They run in herds. Oh, just Blair with Blair. <laughs> So I just heard an echo of myself, which is crazy. And now Sadie's barking at a mirror image of herself in the window. <laughs> That's a pretty good sign of intelligence. A lot of dogs don't react to reflection or uh, the dog that uh, is currently here at this place, which I think is part Corgi and part uh, some sort of Japanese dog. It's a very intelligent, squat, long, good night noodles looking thing. Um, Which I think is part corgi at and part, the uh, some sort of Japanese dog. Oh, there's that echo again. What are you, what are you doing, Kiki? <laughs> what weird echoing. buttons are you hitting? Are you trying to like isolate drops? <laughs> Bam! For the morning right. show or what? <laughs> That's right. Morning I'm gonna... zoo. Can I get DJ, a few Your things? DJ monitor is uh, bleeding out into the. Uh, it is. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't uh, turn off my monitor. Yeah, I want. What I'm trying to do is. Uh, I had to get into my Twitch channel to block somebody who is posting spam in the comments. Mm. Oh, I see that. Yeah. I don't want to become famous. I already am. You're famous. <laughs> How do I delete that, though? Can I delete that comment? How do I delete it? Oh, Goldazator, I see you in there. How do I want to just go boop. Delete comment. Mm. I don't know how to moderate. I'm not. I have to learn how to be better at the twitching. Mm -hmm. Speaking of Twitch gaming, um, how I'm. I just want to say thank you to everyone who watched our show tonight instead of playing. What is it? Cyberpunk twenty seven seventy seven. What is? Is that what it's called? It's a new video game. Huh. It's a it's a a world game. It's called Cyberpunk 2077 and it's, okay. it's supposed to be amazing, but it just came out today. And so for those of you who may have downloaded it already, maybe you're playing it and watching us at the same time yeah, or you maybe can do you're just watching us and thank you for watching our show instead of playing a brand new video game. Mm -hmm. Or thank you for tuning in to us now, knowing that you need a break from the last 72 hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Constant video game playing. But wait, did I you have a question in there? Hot. Wait, why are you talking about this video game? Because it just came out, and I think somebody very, very, very early on in the chat at one point said, oh, there are people here not playing video games. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and I remembered that and I was I just wanted to thank everybody for being here for the show instead of a new video game. I do appreciate that. There's going to be plenty of time for video games tomorrow. I don't know. Marshall got it. Mm. I'm I'm going to have to spend some time messing up <laughs> messing up his character. <laughs> Oh, I thought you were going to say just like walking across the the TV field of vision at inopportune moments. That's also fun. <laughs> yeah. No, can't do it. He plays he plays on his office computer, so Oh, okay. I can, not down in the living room. Mm -hmm. Thank goodness I would get so annoyed. Mm -hmm. ah, video games are overrated. It depends on the video game for yeah. sure. And it depends on the Depends on the time and the place and the people. For sure. I've been thinking I want to get back. Uh, Mist is in VR. And I was oh, thinking dang. It would, I was thinking it'd be fun to play Mist in VR. A puzzle Spooky. Spooky. All by yourself. Oh, no. In the virtual Mist world. No, thanks. Solving puzzles. <laughs> Spooks. <laughs> so I don't, I don't really uh, have a video game machine or play video games. Uh, I have in the past, um, but I don't. I, I don't think they're necessarily overrated, Stephen Rain. One of the things that uh, I do appreciate about video gaming, especially with kids who like to video game quite a bit, is that it's interactive. 
You know, as opposed to watching a television or a, you know, movie or Netflix, which is intriguing as it may be, it's very passive. You're just the observer. You throw yourself mentally into the story. You might get into the excitement a little bit, but you aren't thinking through anything. You're not deciding anything. You're not really interactive. It's the one thing that I think that is uh, intriguing about the modern day video games that are immersive stories and these worlds and all of this is that you, uh, who, the player is driving the story to, to some degree, um, which, which, uh, I don't know. I think there's something at least, at least it's requiring some mental faculty to, to, uh, apply to the thing as opposed to just watching a television screen. But, I, mm-hmm. I, you know, reading is probably better than both. Reading is better than all of the above. Yeah. Although I will I will say that um, Alien Worlds on Netflix is super fun. If not a little creepy, but it's, it's really fun. Have you seen it? Yeah, I was actually thinking about it in... Uh... Uh, one of the, something we were talking about today, I guess it, I, oh, it was about the COVID uh, causing potentially fatigue and this sort of thing. One of the storylines in there is about this fungus that grows that attracts this creature to it. And then this predator eats that creature that got attracted to because they get attracted to it. They lose their sense of fear. Then this predator comes and eats them, but then is poisoned by the uh, fungal infection drops to the floor and the fungus uses it to be the host to recycle its life cycle. So there was yeah. some weird th- it didn't go into it but it was something when you were saying it was like causing all this fatigue. I pictured all uh, us humans as dropping from this tree <laughs> so that the virus could you know could continue its life cycle. Oh that's so funny. Slow us down. Or you could apply it to the all the different ways in which the cat vectors, the, the, the cat vector diseases are attempting to create psychosis in humans. Just trying to get, turn everybody into the crazy cat lady. Because I then, don't want to be a crazy with cat enough lady. cats surrounding her, there'll be enough of them to, to take her down at some point. Message. Oh. Hot Rod uh, is messaging me over on Twitch. Science by Angelus Saini. No, I have not read this. That's intriguing. I'm going to copy this right now. Oh, which which book? Angela Saini is supposed to be amazing. I have not read it myself, but she is over the last year. People have been talking about her her books. Yeah, I have just uh, yeah. set that aside, and I will go look for it. Yeah, it's supposed to be a good one. Uh, did oh, just, Kevin Ballard! Oh no! Did just what did I? Oh gosh, I'm just such a bad memory. What did I just watch tonight? I don't know. So we got a suggestion uh, via triple A S for is it to name a scientist? Is that what it was called? Oh no. Uh... It know, was, this it was from Paul Ronovich. Oh, we shouldn't and... say that because we might not have been supposed to get access. So we'll change the subject right away. That's fine. Oh, but my computer says, so okay. Did, it go? Go. did I, did I delete that? Picture that. of a scientist. Yes. Picture a scientist. Or picture a scientist. Picture a scientist. Yes. Uh, which is uh, a short doc, well, short hour and a half documentary on sexism and racism within STEM, uh, and it is brutally non-flinching. Uh, Ooh, a in. bunch of stories of uh, watch that today. That was really powerful. I don't. I guess it's not out yet. This is a was a sneak preview. Yeah, kind of it's it's doing a bunch of tours right now. It's um it's playing at online conferences and um and other things. But yeah, they're doing private screeners and touring it around. 
And uh, and one of the voices in there, because it's all about impl- uh, some of it is about the implicit bias that we have um, in all of us. And uh, the book that I recommended to all you Twist listeners, Blind Spot. One of the authors is uh, is in there. If you haven't read Blind Spot yet, you need to go find this book and read it. There's audio versions. Actually, I think there might be an audio version of it on YouTube uh, as well that you can go find. Uh, but blind spot the yeah. s- something about why good people think terrible things or whatever uh, however it's set. Um, some some of it in there is some of the exercises which I think is at the Stanford site. There's a ah, shoot I should have a better memory of these things. But there's there's a place where you can go and take these these implicit bias tests. Um, everybody who takes them complains about the test, saying yeah. that it's not accurate. Um, but there's some consistency to it that uh, people find frightening within themselves. You know, you can have implicit uh, anti-African American or anti-gay biases in your thinking, even if you are a gay African American. And this is one of the these things that this is it sort of unveils how entrenched. Uh, some of our thought patterns are that they are biases that we would not expect that we even have uh, in self-evaluating, but come across very, uh, very clearly through these association, uh, word association tests and tasks that they, that they, this, uh, they created here. But anyway, some of that comes up during to uh, a picture a scientist as well. Uh, but blind spot, everybody go check that out. That's a that's a must read or a must listen to, and I encourage you to uh, participate. In fact, I think if you Google implicit bias test, uh, you should be able to find a website for actually taking the test yourself. Hmm. See, I'm sure bias. I have. I like so, to pretend I don't have any implicit bias, but I'm sure no, no, I have no, plenty. Every everyone does. <laughs> Everybody does. We've all got it. Okay, it's at Harvard. Yeah, Harvard has the implicit uh, implicit association test. That's they're not calling it bias. The bias is what the result shows. Uh, I guess, but uh, yeah, it's through Harvard. It's online. You can take it there. Ah. I think I figured out how to make somebody a mod on our tw- on our Twitch channel. Woohoo! <laughs> I don't know. Are these all tests, Justin? There's like a whole list yep. of them. And it it's just Oof. word association. Michael sixty eight. Uh, and they're things timed. are things are quiet but they're not lockdown lockdown i don't i mean people say lockdown there's no lockdown it's just bars and restaurants restaurants are delivery and takeout and i think bars are closed right now yeah don't try to take it right now blair it's impossible to do mm. it while you're this distracted it, they're timed okay. and and it's part of the fun of it is also knowing uh like one of the ones, one of the ones actually, I I got, uh, I flipped the script on the bias, because I think it was like there's some stuff like you're associating first test is associating flowers with positive words, and you'll find that you do this very quickly. Uh, associate and when you see an ins if it's an insect, uh, associate it with the negative word kind of a thing, and when those match, then that one's pretty quick. But then when you try to associate flowers with negative words and insects with positive words, that's when all you do is slow down. It's not that you're going to get them wrong. It's just your mm-hmm. brain slows it's the time down of considerably. Processing. Yeah. And you have to pause and concentrate to make each right decision. And it's that time difference that shows. Now, in the insect with positive one, if you're an entomologist... You're going to nail it the wrong the, the way it wasn't intended, but you might actually the flower one 
you know, you might be okay with that too. Uh, it just depends on where your biases lie. I just and, feel like I'm bad at this. <laughs> but, but, but you got to do it. You got to do it. You are bad uh, at choosing. You got to do it when you're not. Um, yeah. When you're not Talking to other people and not yet yeah, distracted. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah, I already messed up. It's this is like hand eye coordination also though is the problem. Uh it's not it's not so much that, but there is there is it's just I mean then it shouldn't your your hand eye coordination shouldn't change from when they flip the script on you on the test. Wow. And you know what I'm saying? It's it's what it is 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 how long it actually takes you to do the thing that's going to reveal your bias. Right. Oh, interesting. Hmm. You know, and a simple, a simple one of the, I think the simplest version was with a deck of cards. Uh, how long, if you were going to only pick ones that matched, like black card, black card, red card, red card, when they came up, those were quicker than if they were, you were picking out all the ones that didn't match. And then it was like slower, like these weird things where we combine uh, concepts together. And so one of the things that you'll find is that positive concepts are attached to Caucasian more mm. than and negative are easier to associate to African American in these biases tests. And this even happens when African Americans take this test is they'll show at least a slight Caucasian bias most of the time. And it's because we've mm -hmm. been without realizing That's the world we were raised in. Trained yeah. We've been media and word trained to associate words with race that we don't even realize until you jump into one of these tests like this and you, you go through and they're long enough to get you just into trying to do the pattern matching and trying to forget the fact that you're doing anything but a pattern matching. And yet, boy, the times slow down, you know, <laughs> trying to trying to call, you know, flower, lovely, very easy flower. Mm -hmm death it's it's harder it becomes diff mm -hmm. more difficult if you don't have the word association there which makes perfect sense in a lot of scenarios but then you apply it to race then you apply it to gender then you apply it to mm -hmm. you apply it to all these other things that you don't think that you have these word associations and these mental biases uh, connecting thing concepts together and they slow you down and you realize that, yeah we do all have this Okay, I'm starting to understand how this works, but this is like, it's still, I feel like I would be better at this if I was good at video games. <laughs> it's like a hand-eye coordination thing, too. It shouldn't really be. It's just uh, clicking, right? Yeah, but I keep meaning to click one and then click the other one. Well, that, that's your hidden bias. That's the whole what? point of the thing. That's what that is. And, and, you know, like I took it and I had, you know, I had an outcome I didn't like. And I'm like, oh, it's because they primed me with the first round of questions. It screwed up the second round of questions. If I had the first round, second round of questions first, that yeah, people make a lot of excuses <laughs> about this test. But it affects everyone largely because we are, uh, we are trained by our environment. We are influenced. We are nudged. Uh, into decisions by our environment that we're not aware uh, are influencing decisions. Yeah. So, I mean, I understand the theory here. So, like, I'm going through the, um, like, fat-based biased one because mm -hmm. um, that was the first one. I just kind of wanted to see how it worked. Um, and I guess the idea is, like, if you're biased towards thin people or you think being fat is being is bad basically right mm -hmm. like when they pair fat with bad then you're gonna go faster than when they do the opposite yes obese agile you'll be slower than thin agile connection you can be slower to connect if you've been instructed to do that right Thunder Beaver missed the show because cleaning a van. <laughs> Glad you made it. What kind of so, van? I'm not oh in that man. chat room because it'll break my computer right now. But what kind of van is it? 
an ableist test. Well, you can call it ableist, but it's, um, I mean, that's the the terminology that people, that's, that's also kind of a... There's an implicit bias right there. Implicit bias to that yeah. terminology as well, yeah. But it's... Um, Trust it's me, there's a lot at, of linebackers uh, or yeah, offensive we, linemen who move much more agilely than I do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's just trying to 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 re, to teach people about these. You 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 pick things up whether or not you're aware of them, and you hold views whether or not you really think you do. And there are things things in your head that you didn't explicitly learn or don't explicitly talk about and being aware of them and knowing what they are makes it easier for you to learn how to counteract them and how to be more, you know, how to work with more people. How to better live in a reality that's based on yeah. reality. A diverse not... reality. Well, even, <laughs> I mean, even in, in like, like in a weird way, like forgetting about all of the, diversity bias that this has shown all the race mm -hmm. and gender and or sexual orientation and whatever biases this thing can illuminate despite all of those forget the, any specific one but it sh it really did the frightening thing is it illustrates that we are often operating in an unreality we are yeah. we are operating in the realm of word association we are in living in a realm of previous association applied to a thing that has no relevant connection to that other event, which means in a large way, we often live in a false reality in our perceptions of the world around us. Yeah, and I, I think we forget very often, um, especially, you know, if you consider yourself intellectual and thoughtful and critical of evidence and, and critical of things in the world around you, you, you forget how much of our neuropsychology is based on immediate emotional reaction as opposed to those, those deeper logical, rational thoughts. And yeah, if you've been thinking about stuff and internalizing things over time, then those emotional reactions are probably going to be, you know, maybe a little better for a situation. But for many of us, maybe, you know, we try, but maybe you haven't internalized things enough. And it's going to be that, that gut reaction, that the thing that comes out first is or the, the feeling that you have about something, the reaction you have is not going to be intellectual because uh, we use heuristics and we use shortcuts and our, 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 our brains like to jump on things and you have to stop yourself and learn how to stop yourself and slow your brain down and, and get away from the emotion and get into or, you know, add to the emotion with your logic and your reason control the emotion with your logic and your reason yeah and i think it also does show the need for uh what you were saying the diversity in media and storytelling and voices that are heard because mm -hmm. the more of that we have uh when it does apply to race gender preference uh, orientation um body language I love nationality Caroline. ethnicity <laughs> Um, everything yeah. but politics. I think we reserve a hard line there. Everything else, though, all those, all those. Uh, uh, when you, if you can alleviate uh, those biases within yourself, you do less harm to the world around you. Uh, we, live in a, we live in a better place. I would like to be in a better place, a world of compassion, empathy. Thoughtfulness, sustainability. Yeah. Now, having planning said that, for the long term, that, living get... for our great grandchildren and not ourselves. Yeah. What? H having said that, I do believe we do need to uh, keep most of the world away from those who think this way until we can get them to think that way. So I think most of the world. I'm, I've lost faith in humanity this year. I'm sorry. <laughs> 
I, I just kind of, really yeah. did. I haven't because we have this amazing group of people who join us every week for this show. We have amazing listeners who pull us into their ears every week. We have, it's, it's a reminder every week coming back, I think, has been a reminder to sit here with both of you and with, with everyone in the chat room and everyone who's watching and be able to go, yeah, okay, yeah, things are really bad and people are acting like, they're acting like toddlers, but <laughs> at the same time... No, no, toddlers are not toddlers racist are and not, violent yeah. and awful and stupid. Yeah. Toddlers but at the are same, actually really, like, pretty but decent But that's, people. it's not everybody, but it's, it's, it's not toddler. everybody. And it's, we, there, there are lots of thoughtful, amazing people in the world, and more, th there, there were lots of thoughtful, amazing people. There, there, yes, there are lots, and I am reminded of that community by our community. So one of the really cool things you can do is help elevate those voices, right? Um, so that's yes. definitely something that um, I spent a lot, a lot of time learning about this past summer, especially yeah. as, um, you know, as a as a white person in in something you know going on uh, like this. Sometimes just saying this sucks is like not enough it's more to to elevate voices of people who are underrepresented is one of the best things you can do because one of the implicit biases that people have is that uh sometimes people listen to white people more than uh others and so if you can elevate a non-white voice use that implicit bias to help uh give voice to those who don't have as much of a platform that's something that you can do interesting yeah 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 giving if yeah giving other people using your platform to lift other people up mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's very important yeah <sighs> well we've got it figured out <laughs> i don't know about other people no <laughs> what did we figure out <laughs> no. everything we fixed it All i would like it. to figure <laughs> out i need to get a new pair of headphones before next week uh, yeah, because... this is not looking good, whatever you're doing what you here. Do? Yeah, I haven't figured out what's up with that. I think I... it's also more than just my head. So there's a a, a glitch. This is an, an Apple earbuds that, you know, you can change the volume by pressing the little thing on the cable, right? Except it doesn't stay, and so I have to hold it so that I can hear you. <laughs> oh, oh, no. <laughs> but the other headphones... the there's something wrong with the connection or the the cable on the other headphones I was using because they kept going in and out. So you'd get a good volume and then suddenly you'd be whispering and then you'd only be in my left ear and then you'd get oh, good geez. volume in both ears again. And right, I was Blair, like, <laughs> Blair, I told you we shouldn't have messed with her. Oh yeah. That was such a cool thing. I feel I bad I don't know now. what you're talking headphones about. Headphones are fine. Wonky was this thing headphones. Blair had thought would be funny. Just, I'm talking the same volume this whole time. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, I have, I think I'm going to be looking into a new Scarlet USB mm. interface and headphones, or maybe just a new headphone plug. I don't know. I got to figure it out. But. It could just be a loose connection, and maybe if I just get a little tiny screwdriver and undo some screws, maybe I can fix a connection. But yeah, no. yes, Apple is going to have five. They they have new earbuds. They want five million dollars for their <laughs> new earbuds. <laughs> and let me guess, they have a a plug that no other earbuds or phones have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <gasps> right, that nobody else does. No. Uh, Probably Bluetooth at this point, right? Yeah, noise canceling is not going to be great for music with your in-ear monitors. In-ear monitors are great. There's a, a company I've come across called New Hera that has Bluetooth in-ear their earbuds. And so you can listen to podcasts or books on tape, you know, connect through the Bluetooth and hear things, um, connect to your phone, all that kind of stuff. Um but it's noise canceling and it also is personalizable. So you can listen to sounds and it adjusts the frequency ranges 
Mm. depending on how your ears work. That's cool. So they're um, they're being wow. used. They were they were made for people who are experiencing uh, hearing loss and hearing decline. So they're made, and people uh, people who talk about using them, they they will wear these earbuds to concerts, and it allows them to be able to turn down the crowd and actually hear the concert that they want to listen to. Wow. So they sound like really cool ear. I'd like to try them out before. You know, they're about, a, I think they're going to, I think they cost about 350 or 400 for the Jeez. earbuds. So it's a, it's a pretty little penny to throw into something. That's why yeah, I'd like but to it's try them out first. It's actually pretty cheap. First, actually yeah. pretty cheap if, if you could like. If you think about it. Tune out that one person in the office. <laughs> uh, exactly. Just like, I can hear everybody now except that one person. Worth yeah. it. Yeah. Worth it. Worth it. Totally worth it. Yeah. Anyway, as as my tinnitus increases and my I don't know, maybe it's not the earbuds, maybe it's my ears. I do find myself going what a lot more <laughs> to my child. That could also be have its own reasons. What? You want to talk about video game? What? No. Huh? What? Huh? I don't want to hear about Breath of the Wild again. No. <laughs> <laughs> yes, will they sell you one earbud? I don't know about that, Kevin Jones. Sound blaster headphones. Those Oof. sound incredible. A gaming headset with a detachable boom mic, downloadable equalizer for voice changing and sound. Awesome. Well, Brandon, all that amazing? work just just to... About? To mute all the other players whenever uh, you play one of those games. Brian's yeah. playing a game now that where people can like talk to each other, mm -hmm. and you want like, those headsets. Can you mute that, please? Because <laughs> it's always just a bunch of people going like, "Oh man!" It's just like that over and over, and I'm like, "I don't need to hear that." <laughs> Yanks, I'm good. <laughs> it's that or like weird bullying. Yeah. Also, so I'm good. <laughs> because he's playing with 14 year olds. Yeah. You know, uh, Thunder Beaver, I, I, no, Beats is all marketing. Beats had, yeah, that's all marketing. They are not the, they're not super high quality. They look good, but they're not. Yeah, the no, I was, headphones. I was writing in the chat. That's I had so a pair of the Bluetooth ones um, and they lasted a year. The sound was great. Uh, the functionality was very cool, but they lasted a year. Yeah. Um, it was a big and bummer. If you're, if you're, the, if, the button broke, and they wouldn't charge after a yeah. year. Yeah, if you're if you're like a, a, an audiophile music person, you're not going to buy Beats. Yeah, and, Beats are Beats are be, fine, but they're, and you're not going Bluetooth. Fine. You're going to be plugged in. Yeah, you want to be plugged in. Bluetooth compresses, and it's not great for audio quality. And mm -hmm. there's all yeah, Bluetooth. <laughs> Voice changing might be fun for the podcast. You know what? It could have, be fun. Uh, I have a new computer coming because the other one turns out everything that got bent was attached directly to the motherboard on the. No. It was like designed to do exactly the way it died. There's, uh -huh. there's, there's no cards what? anymore. Everything's just little components soldered onto whatever onto the. Uh, so forget it. I just got a new computer, but when I get it back, uh, when I get this new computer, it's on its way. Uh, there's that plus uh, Kevin saying if we did voice changing on the show, got me a vocoder. Oh my god, you got a vocoder. I've had this for a long time. I've got this uh, vocoder. No. Plus I've got uh, I've got some other uh, some other toys that I might be able to run audio through, uh, some plugins and such. And we're gonna play around to see. I it may be a different host every week. <laughs> Could be. You never know. I mean, I could change all the the pan and the, the low, mid, and high frequencies on my... Yeah, no, I'm not going to touch anything. Something do people happened. do do motorcycle racing near where you are? Yes. <laughs> yes. <Okay>. Yep. <laughs> okay. uh, and I can well, never tell when they're coming. It's not yeah. like I can be like, oh, here they come. Let me mute. No. <laughs> it's the motorcycle. Yesterday... Last night, I think it was like three cars were racing on the freeway. Woke me up in the middle of the night. I swear, 
I thought that aliens were coming down. <laughs> Swear. Well, because, oh, we haven't talked about this because the Galactic Federation. You've heard about the Galactic Federation, right? No. No. Yes. So, yes, I have heard yes. about this. Um, okay, Google we have to. Yes. Yes. Because. <laughs> the Galactic Federation of Light? No, uh, no, has been waiting for us to have a space force to militarize space so that they'd be like, oh, welcome to like the universe. This one. Former mm-hmm. Israeli space security chief says extraterrestrials exist and Trump knows about it. Is that what you're yes. talking about? Yeah. Yes. Nonsense. There what? it is. <laughs> yes. Because that man the- could keep a secret or not say the obvious right. thing that's a lie and make it sound like it's a lie. If there's one thing he's known for, bop bop bop. <laughs> it's not being able to hide a lie. Okay. Even uh Galactic though- Federation has been waiting for humans to reach a stage where we will understand what space and spaceships <laughs> are. Thank you, Carol. Do we have to says Justin? Says <laughs> Justin. This should be the this should be the red flag for what's coming. But go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, so dear. um so many things, but uh d- so yes, they... the, this Israeli ex security guy he has a book coming out, apparently. Great. So this is just a big this is a big media blitz cool. so that so that this guy can sell a book. So it sounds um, like the Galactic Federation yeah. um follows the prime directive. They were just waiting just waiting for, for us to, mm-hmm. to get the technology where we could handle first contact. You can't handle the truth. With a militarized space force as opposed yeah. to Voyager. Right. Peaceful. Like, yes, the Voyager right. Golden Record would no. have been a good start for Stop sure. Stop it. Although, I mean, although we did yes, forget to put take, in a key. Let's to, like, take the military to at. space because then suddenly people want space people want to talk to us yeah, what no, have you guys make watched any sense. did you like see space sense. force did you see the first season no i, I saw the I first couple it. of episodes the first episode fantastic and then it just kind of went downhill after that i, thought. I loved it i love i cannot wait until the next season but really it it explores kind of this idea of like what happens when you put military in, in space in space <laughs> yeah i wasn't there a monkey? There was the monkey. That was there, I saw. There was a I chimp. Think that was yeah. the chimp. A chimp. That yeah. was the last episode I saw. <laughs> yeah, that was a rough episode for sure. That was rough. I was like, Wait, the chimp is going to the Russians now, and now the Russians have a chimp. I don't know what's going on. <sighs> Oh, no way. Uh, the White House and Israeli officials did not immediately respond for comment. No. I'm a shock. No, you're not. No, you're not. Surprise. Uh, Really? Is this how we're going to find out? This is so dumb. (laughs) (sighs) Um, So that's interesting. I didn't know about that, but I thought there were aliens last night. That's funny. Um, It's just the three pitches of these cars racing on the freeway Wee. made it sound like it was like descending down it was wow. it was very scary so suddenly no, it was all close encounters of the third uh, time which if aliens had the technology for s- space flight they would have uh, cloaking and uh, stealth technology. Just saying. <laughs> Probably. Yeah. Really gonna tell me lovely. that they're gonna be like, it's kind of loud. That's ah, fine. That's fine. It's no problem. We developed like interstellar space flight, but do we want to work on this this road noise? Nah, it's fine. It's fine. Yeah, Doppler is cool. Yes. Doppler. What are some good hard science sci-fi shows or movies or books? <gasps> okay. I really liked Battlestar Galactica. Agree with you, Michael68, until the la- the end of the last season. Like, it just went... <clears throat> like, they had to wrap it up, and they 
ended it. I, yeah, the end of Battlestar Galactica was not satisfying for me in the least. Um, I, from a book perspective, love Altered Carbon by Richard Morgan. Mm. Um, great book. There are a couple of books in the series about, they're kind of like noir detective, but sci-fi and pretty hard, great stuff, really well-written. Um, those became net, uh, I think a Netflix series or mm-hmm. Amazon's Netflix I think, series. I think it was Netflix. Mm-hmm. And that went two seasons and it was pretty good. It wasn't great, but it was entertaining and, and pretty good. I enjoyed it. Um, the, what are Expanse. some other good ones? The Expanse. The Expanse is good, yeah. The Expanse is amazing. Yeah. And that's going to be, that's going until, what, six seasons? They're going to be doing, they got extended to do through the sixth season and then i don't know everybody's shut season it down. seems to be on hold right now because of the covid but the expanse is definitely yeah. but they have uh, a season five coming out if, pretty soon if we're talking uh hard science fiction uh expanse I is think an amazing book series they do they do a really good job of you know you have to leave voicemails in space because you don't have instant yeah. communication over long distances. So people are getting voicemails again. You got the little red dot flashing on the console, meaning, oh, somebody left us a message. Let's see what they want. Uh, which some people don't even know what a voicemail is because I don't think people use that anymore. Or voicemail? Machine. What but, is? But because you can't have, you know, over... Uh, vast distances of space, you don't have real-time telecommunications anymore. So they, they introduce little things like that. I think mm-hmm. they still might have explosion-y sounds in space. Uh, too bad. But, yeah, you know, they, they do a pretty decent job. Yeah. Um, I also really enjoy books by Becky Chambers is her name I think it's Be- Becky Betsy Chambers Becky Chambers I'm trying to look for it right now I've got a ton of books on my Kindle Marshall and I read a lot of science fiction somebody says believing in aliens is anti I don't know look here's the thing about here's the thing about Hitler believing what? In no look, let's not go here, there here's the thing about aliens here's here's the thing here's the thing you need to understand about if you just drop suspend all doubt and take all the accounts of the little gray men and you believe them here's what the only solution to that is that they do not come from outer space they only can be future humans their morphology is the four-limbed uh hominid bipedal hominid they're hominids they have the nose in the same place the eyes in the same place the mouth in the same place they're bald, yes, they got, they're small, and they got, you know, hairless, whatever. But at some point after living indoors under artificial light because the environment outside is just too hostile, that's what everyone will look like. And yeah, the long fingers help you type longer or work with the new iPhone, which is as big as a flat screen TV. So you need those longer fingers to be able to text send a text message. Now, they seem to be coming from space, right? No, no, no. You don't understand how it works. They're traveling from time back in time. And when you go back in time, things aren't where you left them. Everything's somewhere else. You just need a small, it's not even an interstellar, not an uh, intergalactic or even interstellar, just a within the solar system spaceship to fly back to where the Earth was or is now because everything's moved. You got to fly over to it, land again. Now. What do they do when they get here? Yeah. They start probing people's behinds, right? No. Why would you do that? Why would you do that? Suspend Science. Out, assume everything's right. These are future microbiologists getting, yes. getting microbiome cut microbiome samples. Microbiome samples. They need it because why? We overused antibiotics in the future. And now people, everybody's got the gut problems. These little That's crazy. they're gray. They're little gray people. They look cute, but they're they all have dysentery of, like all the right. time. Mm-hmm. So, so they go back <laughs> to a time and they, they get the swabs and they cultivate and they bring them back to their future. And so, 
And so now they can now they can replenish the microbiome of the future and everything's safe again. They don't care about what else is going on. They're not trying to interfere with society. And they're not from another planet. Those are definitely future humans. Those are definitely future humans. I love that like idea. It. So you're not going to get the exact same evolution on another planet that has to travel here through space. It's not going to look like us. Star Trek is only books? looks like Star Trek where everything's a hominin because they didn't have the budget to CGI a new alien <laughs> race. It's for true. Every... It's you can always race. tell too when they're like, oh, it's a class M planet. Like, oh, you guys just didn't want to wear spacesuits. I get it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was, was too it difficult. Not... Babylon 5. That's a good classic sci-fi series. So good. If you haven't seen it, check out Babylon 5. That was Are we talking was it sci-fi or hard science? Maybe I got it confused. Hard sci-fi. Hard sci-fi. Um, so Children of Time and Children of Ruin are two amazing books. Really, really enjoyed them. Um, involve terraforming and uh, biology and DNA and information transfer and spiders and octopuses. And I don't want to say any more than that, but it's amazing. Um, Claire, pop quiz. How many uh, brains does an octopus have? All of them. That's a good question. Nine or more? <sighs> not, I think nine is the correct answer. Very good. I mean, but it depends on what you call a brain, because that's the whole thing, too. <laughs> they have they have like nerve balls in their mm -hmm. in their arms. Yeah, it's a little mini brains. Could be function autonomously. And then one central one. So many. I mean, they sort of do and they sort of don't. They like, if you cut off an arm, it's not like they're going to um, solve a puzzle. But if you cut off an arm, it like reacts if you poke it. <laughs> so like, that's, that's the thing is that like, it responds to stimuli, but it doesn't think or process in the same way. But there is a more central ganglia that yes. is like donut more shaped. of yes. There's the donut ganglia, and then there's the those sensory ganglia that are out. So mm -hmm. it's like two different brains mm -hmm. that process that yeah, that deal with information separately. Exploration, mm -hmm. sensation. Mm -hmm. Okay, now what are we gonna do? What are we doing? Can I fit through that? <laughs> sure. Sure. Let's try. Ooh, everything by Kim Stanley Robinson. I what did I run across recently? He has a new book out. The Mars series, Shinago, is always good. Definitely would recommend that. But he has a new book out that has to do with I think it's another Earth climate change type book. It's supposed to be really good. Not a lot of people. Yeah, I love uh, oh, Stephen Ray. Farscape had a wonderful episodes. It was Jim Henson meets Star Wars in a really weird way. Uh, Star Trek, like you so. mean? <laughs> no, no, yeah. Star, more like Star Wars. I thought it was uh, more like Star Trek. What no, was... because Muppets. It still had Muppets. Star that's Trek not, has that's no not Muppets. what makes it. Star Wars has Muppets. Yeah, it's Yoda. But if you're talking Muppet. about the plot, yeah. it's way more Star Trek than Star Wars. No, I don't think so. Yeah. I would be pretty great. But however, uh, uh, I would what? say I would say my uh, my favorite hard science is going to be Doctor Who. My hard I science fiction Doctor is going to be Doctor Who, because even when it's there's not a hard something... science fiction, oh, it absolutely is. It's a because... lot of like flim flam language. I gotta say, <laughs> yeah, uh, you know there really is a bit of that in any sci-fi, but when. When it really comes down to like everything seems like it's happening by magic or some supernatural thing, it's like, eh, no, actually, it's a uh, robotic device that they've created that's built into the thing. Like they find a more scientific -y solution or reasoning behind a thing. All right, I they see usually that. Usually, don't leave it just completely up to magic or that's what that race does with their crazy mind power that can do a thing. They actually take that step to connect it to some sort of reality somewhere. 
Yeah, except Somewhere, for yes, kind it's of, not a sort of. To, it's a to sonic Tim and screwdriver. Point, which, which I am like getting at, really but... frustrated. So I'm I'm watching Doctor Who right now. I started um I love Doctor Who a few, but, yeah. uh, last year, I guess I started, and I'm almost done with David Tennant right now. But um the amount of things that he does with that screwdriver is starting to frustrate Ooh, me no, just no, a little okay. bit. Okay. Just because like okay, I get it, like it like it But it's a it sonic resonates. screwdriver. Yeah, no, I get that. But like it shouldn't also like flip switches and it does change the thing. color Why wouldn't of things. It? Why wouldn't and, like, it? Of course it does. It's a little too much for me where he's just like points it at a computer and it magically does exactly what he wants the computer to do. And I'm like, but "But you have one button on that device. (laughs) But wait a second. But he had to smack the screwdriver a few times to get it in the exact right frequency to be able to get it to do that. Didn't we just cover last week how (sighs) Sonic, or when was the week before, Sonic Technologies with these metal on uh, organic... uh, frameworks are uh-huh. the wave of the future at the nanotechnology level this mm-hmm. is doctor who's just known this like 50, you know, forever like, for 50 traveler. years of course he knows it He's, that's why oh they wrote God. it in because they have a real time traveler that they're consulting with on all this stuff obviously to have gotten it right 50 60 years ago uh, that sonic is the technology of the future that's going to handle nanotechnology and change everything yeah, just toothbrushes, electric toothbrushes. That's that's the future. No, oh Sonic. Not just no, Sonic. I'm saying that because you know Sonic hair. Get it? It's a jo- anyway. And I also, you know, what else I appreciate? I also appreciate that it's a science fiction adventure where uh, wits. Uh, Gallifrey. Wits not are Ganymede. Used, <laughs> wits are used to. Uh, to win the day, to solve the problem, to get to the end. Very seldom ever is violence. Yeah. Shooting laser guns and back and forth. And I, 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 let me just say, I just watched uh, one episode only ever yet of The Mandalorian, the Star Trek uh-huh. on the pay-per-view CBS thing. No, and it was, no, CBS, what are you talking about? It's on <laughs> Disney Plus. It's on whatever Disney, it's on, so. whatever it's on. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's the Star Trek that's on that paper. Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. Whatever it was, it was a shootout between, like, two people and a whole bunch of stormtroopers. Mm-hmm. And the joke that was, like, from the movies when they kept missing the good guys because none of them could, could shoot straight. Like, they're going to take the helmet off and there's going to be eyes each d- opposite direction and not by focus. And it was, that's all it was, like, pew, 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 and, like, stormtroopers missing with every kind of, like, a machine laser gun and still can't hit the barred side of a barn. And, like, it's just such a joke anyway. And then all the violence for, what? Car chase and violence So the Mandalorian, episode. first of all, is, it, I don't, it, so if I can just, I'm not trying to you defend anything. Are argue about this now? No, 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 no. Doctor I'm Who not, versus the Mandalorian. I, I, I am a fan of about. both. You're making me but scratch my head. The Mandalorian is fashioned after Westerns and samurai films. Yeah. It is an homage to those genres. And if you watch it with that in mind, it's actually very cool. Because you you get to see, like, um, there was the episode, not this past week, but the week prior, had stuff straight out of um, black and white samurai films that you would see um, that are, are quite artful and masterfully done. And it's, I think that is the idea is that it's an homage to these, um, to these genres that are, are completely different. It's an apples and oranges scenario. I watched the two so, shows for completely different reasons. So the current right. show that I watched, which is the last one that was out. It's the only one I've ever seen. Yeah. Reminded me of an episode, the every ep- every episode of, which you don't remember, The A-Team. Uh-huh. Which at some point during the show, a bunch of people shot machine guns at mm-hmm. the heroes. And somehow yeah. they just ducked in time or got behind a thing. And then they'd shoot their machine guns back. And actually nobody would die. Doesn't that all. Magnum P.I. also? Yeah, because you couldn't kill people, I guess, shows. on television yet. Yeah, no no killing. Just But they would still shoot <laughs> machine guns at each other, and nobody could aim back then because everybody couldn't afford prescription glasses. Anyway, but I do appreciate that Doctor Who finds a sci-fi adventure pathway without having to resort to 
a car chase, or occasional car chase, or shoot out a violent punching people in the face thing to solve problems. And I think it's a much better message. Plus, I agree that the, uh, or I, I again propose my agreeing with myself, my early argument, that they do uh, at least try to introduce scientific concepts. Uh, whereas a lot of places, a lot of sci-fi just likes to gloss past it. I appreciate that Doctor Who doesn't like violence, but I will say that that show has the highest body count of any show I've ever watched. People are dying constantly on Doctor Who. Constantly. Yeah. So it is interesting that that's his whole thing, is that he hates guns and he's like anti-violence. People die but anyway. I don't, have to I don't die know from if I've gun. seen an episode where someone hasn't died at this point. <laughs> So fair enough, fair enough. I think I think that's very I I was thinking about that okay. the other day that so, like for somebody that hates violence okay the but, the bad guy dies a lot on that show me, sure he no. doesn't shove them into a black hole but they find a way to die a lot of the time sometimes but not always but here's the other part of that <clears throat> it's the bad guys who are resorting to violence yes it's the bad people that kill people the good guy doesn't. That's, I think, the moral that we would want to be teaching. Bad people. When you have the good guys breaking the rules, being violent, shooting people, Han shot first. Guido yeah. or whatever his name was just like still talking. It's like, ah, no, ah, you know. Han's like, ah, not a good guy. That's no. not his thing. <laughs> it's not his thing. Never was. They're always yeah. shooting first. They're all, He's they're, not a like, good guy. It's like Han? the bad guys show up and it's like, oh, hey, you're the... <laughs> but then when the bad guys show up, they're like, hey, you should come with us. Because, yeah, we don't want to hurt you. We'd like you to come. We want you to talk to somebody. And then they, they either... So you heard it shot. here, folks. Justin sympathizes with the Empire. I just want to make that very clear. <laughs> they don't... I, after a while of getting shot first, I kind of think, yeah... I mean, obviously, they didn't train anybody to shoot. Oh, they just have Blair, the guns for catch. decoration or <laughs> ceremony or something. They weren't actually meant to use them in violence because oh, nobody's ever been trained how to aim one of those things. Oh, my God. None of the stormtroopers have ever been trained how to aim one of those no, things. They weren't no. meant to be violent. They're just a no. show of force. Mm -hmm. That's why they miss all the time. No clue how to use this thing. I'd love to be able to hear their back channel conversations do you know how this thing works how do you take the safety off why are we wearing even wearing this we, armor it doesn't work at all it's, it's a it's uniform it's, it's not totally, armor let's be serious I mean, it doesn't stop anything it's know. just a uniform mm -hmm. Hurrah! and then you have the the wilhelm scream is the yes always <laughs> as the stormtrooper you gotta explain all starships and uh all you starships what and that is. I know what that is. People that was know what the Wilhelm is. That was a voiceover sound they? that was made like in an old western where the guy goes, ah! And there are, there are multiples in, in, now, actually. There's one in particular, but there are... a thousand times. It's in Indiana yeah. Jones. It's in Star Trek. It's probably all over the A-team. It's like you hear this scream get thrown in. It's Once a little you... thing. The audio files are like, I got to put it in every movie. Once you so hear it, no, you hear thing. it everywhere. Once you know what yeah. it sounds like, you hear it in every single movie or show. I, I hear it all over the place. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it's put in Star Wars stuff as like a cookie now. Like it's a it's an it's a fun homage to the original trilogy. Yes. Like part of the deal. Oh, my God. All right, sci-fi fans. I think my eyes want me to go to sleep. Mm -hmm. I have work to I do keep blinking I and rubbing my eyes and yawning and I'm like my eyes feel like I got stuff in them I should go to sleep All I got right. sleep say good night Blair sands. good night Blair say good night Justin good night Justin good night Kiki. Kiki good night everyone I hope that you have sci-fi wait Sci no sci-fi fantasies and no never mind doctor who dreams there we go <laughs> i pity the fool sci-fi fantasies and doctor who dreams good night everyone have a wonderful week we look forward to seeing you again next week thanks for sticking around so that we could find out 
just what kind of an empire sympathizer Justin is. (laughs) 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 Oh, yes. I love this conversation. Sci-fi? I love it. Okay, let's have a wonderful night's sleep, some good book reading, some good learning, and some good times. And we'll be back next week. Have a happy birthday, both of you, in the oh, meantime. Yeah. Thank you for reminding me. You're welcome. <laughs> We're, well, I'll keep quiet about it, except for when I'm not keeping quiet about it. It's like a birthday, <laughs> unbirthday. A no, very fine. merry unbirthday to you, to you. A very merry unbirthday to you, to you. I don't know the rest of the words, but that's good. Okay. Good night, everyone. <laughs>